Um, and it's, first of all, I want to thank all of our partners ongoing who make the festival possible, including the lovely Women's Museum who've given us this venue today. So we can give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> okay. And uh, VCAS, UNESCO, Behalf and Hanoi Grapevine, who have been working in partnership for us over the last five years. So what is this morning or this today about? Um, okay, so we're in Vietnam. We know we're in Vietnam because we look around us and we see things that are Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, so what is it? What are those elements of culture and the space and the traditions that make Vietnam what it is and what we recognize today? And also, what is that going to look like in the future? How do we keep the cultural heritage, but we don't want to pickle in, in aspects so it becomes irrelevant. We want to make sure it's contemporary and we want to make sure that it's sustainable for the future. Um, so we've got some fantastic speakers here today and I know it's going to be um, a, a really interesting day. I hope you will make new connections. I hope out of this symposium there will be some new projects that bubble up and emerge. Um, and um, I want to kind of now introduce the people who are going to make it happen today. Unfortunately, I can't stay because I have to whiz across town to another workshop. Um, but uh, I know that my team will feed back to me and uh, let me know what wonderful things come out of the session. Introduce uh, Rachel Jahar, Rachel, uh, who's... Uh, I guess the powerhouse behind today and Christian who's going to help her with moderation. Um, from my team we also have Michelle. Okay. Uh, we have uh, other speakers. So we have Tao from Kilomet 109. I'm sure a lot of people know her. She's very well known here. Uh, we have a lo lovely team of people from Melbourne as well. Uh, Dr. Alison Bennett. Um, Associate Dean of Photography. Uh, we have Windu Ann from Moving Image Artist. Windu, okay. Uh, Dr. Alan Hill, uh, also from RMIT Melbourne. Uh, and Paul Antoine Lucas, I believe. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, there are other speakers this afternoon, but I, I don't think they're in the room, so uh, they'll pardon me if I don't go through the whole list because I know you're dying to get started. Um, so thank you to all our speakers. Really appreciated uh, you giving up your time today. And um, I'm not going to bore you any longer by talking on and on and on. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel uh, to kick off the proceedings and get things going. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. <laughs> okay, so Christian, come and stand up because we're doing this together. So Christ <laughs> Christian and I are like the, the people today that are going to be the wingman of trying to support all of our fabulous speakers. Um, so firstly, thank you very much, for everyone, for coming and um, being with us today. We are really excited. I've been excited about this symposium for weeks, um, particularly because we have such an amazing lineup of speakers that are all coming together to speak about um, this notion of future heritage and trying to unpack and deconstruct and to propose new, new ways of thinking about it, particularly within Vietnamese context. Okay, so um, there are, as you've seen, there's some headsets uh, going around. Um, so we have live translation um, that um, you can pop on or pop off, however you choose. Uh, when asking questions, the session works where we have 15 minute um, time slots. Now, I'm thinking, do we, I'm looking at V because V's our other wingman, our secret wingman over here. Do we still have the cards so that the speakers get told when they've got five minutes left? Is that Quinn that was? Okay, so V is going to like give some sort of like interpretive dance movement when you've got <laughs> five minutes left. Um, so to give you a bit of a warning, a heads up. Um, and then at the end of the speakers, we have a one hour panel discussion. So please, please, please ask as many questions as you want because we would love to hear all of your questions and discussion. Um, with that, so um, on that, I'm going to hand over to Christian, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, yeah, I'm also very honored and thanks for the invitation to co-host with you. And um, our first speaker I want to introduce today is uh, Michelle Teague, who is an associate lecturer in design study. 
and who has worked professionally as a transnational practitioner and educator in art and design um, and communication in the Middle East and in Vietnam. And uh, she was the key academic contact for the Vietnam Festival of Media and Design in 2019 and in 2020 co-curated No Rain Without Clouds and uh, facilitated the launch of Design Studies program here at the RMIT Hanoi campus. Um, she is a graduate of the Master of Art in Public Space from RMIT University, Melbourne, and uh, she has exhibited in Australia, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, and Vietnam. Uh, prior to becoming an educator, she also ran a graphic design agency in Sydney for over 10 years, and Teek's areas of research are um, creative practice, uh, social design, creative and cultural ecosystems, urban spaces, digital archives and storytelling. And right now, uh, there's also um, a recently completed uh, project about future-proofing museums about here in Vietnam, the digitization of art and culture in Vietnam. I think that really relates very well to today's symposium's topic, which uh, she led together with uh, Dr. Emma Duster and will be published as a book, actually, uh, next year. So welcome, Michelle. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you very much for the introduction. So hello everyone, um, and I'm very excited to be back in Hanoi because I was here for six years and it's just, I feel at home seeing I'm visiting for the two weeks. So um, what, do, what do I do and what am I going to talk to you about today? So let's have a look. Let's make sure I get the button right. Huh? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about translocal sense making. Okay, so I'll explain what that is. Good. To me it makes sense, but yeah, it's kind of like, mm, what, is, what is that? And framing social design practices in future heritage. So it's looking at what I've been doing for the last couple of years and how it can be a method for um, applying creative intelligence but using social design practices to um, achieve kind of the goals that we have in terms of future heritage. So this gives you a sense of what I'm going to look at. So from, and for me, the real question is what can designers and educators do, particularly coming from the perspective of being a foreigner? So that's where that translocal comes into play. So how, what can I do? How can I help without imposing my kind of more Western kind of centric view of things, but actually what approaches can I use to really be of use in the community where I'm currently living? Okay. So translocal sense making. So here it's looking at how I can use design and apply social design skills to um, be of use, to have an impact, and looking at ways that you can harness this to facilitate and curate um, really um, useful kind of design solutions that apply to the place where, where I'm living now, rather than using something that works somewhere else and trying to apply it here when it just might not be the right fit for here at all. So, and then it's looking at the challenges particularly. So digitization has been um, something that's really come to me from listening to the community, particularly the museums here, because it was something that they were finding, they were having challenges with. So part of this design um, approach was to come up with ways that we could assist with the digitization process. So, the team of the researchers, as you can see here, it was led by Dr. Emma Juster, but it came directly out of um, all the conversations we were having for developing the Vietnam Festival of Creativity and Design. As we were visiting the communities, we were coming across these wonderful collections, but they weren't digitised, or if they were in fact digitised, they weren't accessible by the community. They were just kind of static, being stored on computers, but there was no way for researchers and educators and students and the general public to access this information. So you only, you had, only option was to go to the museums. But then of course, COVID happened, okay? So with this, it led to us forming a group. Um, so Dr. Emma Duster, myself, Dr. Jonathan Crellin, Andres Puy, Dr. Tammy Hulbert, 
Ms. Tua Tran and Ms. Ming Fung. So part of this um, solution we came up with was to form an interdisciplinary team because no one person had all the skills to be able to address this. And we were also working in partnerships and we developed a really nice um, partnership with the Vietnam National Museum as well out of this. And in fact, they ended up loaning us equipment for a couple of months because we didn't have the equipment here. So a really nice relationship was built with them. So we were looking at, in depth, what were the opportunities to digitise art and culture in Vietnam? And that became more and more important because during COVID, we, as educators, we couldn't go on field trips to museums and show our students their culture okay, and key aspects of design. So we thought, well, we really need to have digital content because we could show them the Reich Museum, we could show them museums in Australia and so on, but we didn't really have much of an online presence with the museums in Vietnam. So that's where we started to work on this. So we wanted to provide accessible education and research resources as you can see. And part of this is also having um, the Vietnamese professionals in the cultural sector tell their own stories because a lot of content on Vietnam is created globally rather than by Vietnamese people because of various barriers, whether it be technology, human resources, or um, sort of like the, the technical capacity. Okay, so. So translocal sense making, okay? So for me, that's about how I, as a newcomer to a place and space and community, how do I make sense of where I am, okay? So part of that is going out and making the engagements and making the connections and listening and seeing what arises as um, a project I can work on. So I'm a designer, a creative, but I very happily apply my skills to whatever might arise in the community that I'm living in as to what they're saying that they need help with rather than me imposing what I think they should be doing. Okay. So, okay, so again, back to this question, what can designer educators do, particularly as foreigners who are visiting here? Okay. So I was thinking, how might I support this sector Okay, and of course, by supporting the galleries, libraries, archives and museums, we're more broadly supporting the creative industries. Okay, so again, being really mindful of my position as a foreign academic, being mindful of any power imbalances that might apply. Okay, and here in Vietnam, education is really highly privileged and highly respected. Okay, so with that, um, you really be, need to be very mindful that you are <clears throat> using your position responsibly. Okay, so what I'm saying is social design practice is creative intelligence. And it's a creative intelligence that's harnessing a whole community, all the stakeholders, and all those aspects combined to form a creative intelligence. And I think that's now with the complexity of all the problems that we're encountering, we have to have this more social design interdisciplinary approach. And that's something we've been embedding in our research practices, but also with our students, with the projects we're doing, like the one we currently have, which is called Future Ancestors, where we have 25 students from Melbourne and their lecturers coming to work with our students based in Hanoi and our lecturers here. Okay, so part of the methodology, so with this, so how did we make sure what we were doing is what was needed? So after we noticed this particular um, issue arising through listening, we interviewed more than 50 artists and cultural professionals. Okay, so we, again, we made sure, is this, are we right? Is this actually something that people do need help with? And by speaking with them, we came up with, um, looking at how to work with the museum partners using, using a process called photogrammetry to digitise their collections. Um, but more importantly, because there was no, um, the finances weren't there, um, and often there were, things were being done on an ad hoc basis, waiting for funding or waiting for an international um, organisation to come in with a lot of equipment. 
So we said, well, how can we do this now rather than having to wait for funding? So we came up with the um, Andres Puy, who's our a technical person in the group. We were like, well, how can we use low cost or no cost technology programs and applications? So that was our benchmark. We wanted to be accessible and we wanted to be able to do it now and just not wait a couple of years to get going. Okay, so here, so this design and research research-led teaching, it's um, kind of been embedded across the program, like going back to how can design educators help. So we have a common design studio, which we do, which is a two-week online global sprint that we've been doing each year as part of our Capstone One. Um, and then also in Capstone One, we embed its speculative design. So really thinking about the future. So the question, that we're also working on at the moment is what will Hanoi be like in 25 years time, which is for 18 and 21 year olds is not really something that they've considered before. So it's good to start them thinking about how what they design now will impact the future. And then also we've been um, looking at the UN Sustainable Development Goals as part of informing their design process. Um, and with that, we've got the RMIT Vietnam Contemporary Art Collection. We've been integrating that into the curriculum. And also Studio V, which um, is where we bring in um, partners, non-government organisations that we, our students work with directly on projects with them. So in progress, so almost, almost complete, but future-proofing museums. So we had a three-day uh, workshop that we did with cultural organisations. So this we're um, uploading as a free um, material that all cultural organisations can access, looking at how you can digitise your collections. Okay, so that'll be publicly available at no cost. Okay, so again, that kind of resourcing that we can do in terms of social design. And then currently in progress, as I mentioned, is the Future Ancestors Interdisciplinary Studio, where we have all the students currently working with three industry partners in Hanoi and using technologies. And it's um, very research-led, so it'll be interesting to see what they end up doing. So, so the key things are digital inclusion and increasing representation and engagement. Okay. So that's our key kind of goal. Um, and again, it's the design thinking processes and human oriented design that is part of a, a key feature of social design. And that for me, it boils, and also issues that are coming up quite a lot of consideration of designing for the non-human world, okay? So really thinking through our impact, not just on humans, but also on the non-human. And again, that comes back to that listening and accessibility and inclusion. So it's asking questions like, who should be here at this meeting? Who's not being included? Okay. So often um, the community or, uh, you know, the, who have really key insights, but they're not at these critical meetings. And there's a great phrase that I love. I think it was a, an American nun, but she said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu which I think is always a key thing to, <laughs> to consider. Okay. So again, so been working in public pedagogy, so helping with that um, more general. So education beyond the education sector, okay, is an area that we've been working in a lot. Okay, and so digital technologies, they have a lot of power and to, to support and empower the community, but they can also throw up barriers. Okay, in terms of there's language barriers, there's search engine optimization. Um, there's a lot of things that can impact. And also in Vietnam, we're very, we use the mobile phones, whereas the rest of the world maybe be using laptops more. So we need to make sure we're optimizing the experience for people in Vietnam, okay? Okay, so basically flexible problem solving. So sometimes people might call this hacks. And that's where it became really important for us. Our decision was, how can we do it now? Low cost, no cost, okay? Um, and so I think that's a really good skill for us as creative intelligence is to um, take that kind of concept into whatever we do. 
you know, often start small. It doesn't have to be big. Do a little pilot, you know, and, and then see what happens. So a very iterative design thinking approach to these kinds of things. Okay, so there's huge changes, okay, as you can see. That, and particularly, they were heightened during COVID. And there was a lot of really interesting experimentation that was happening at that time. So this gives you an idea of some of the um, what people were saying, like we cannot develop digital platforms due to challenges in human resources and budget. So platforms are limited and there is challenge in resources, which means we cannot exploit international collections. So that was good. We, we, we had an idea and then we made sure that we could see from the research that yes, it really was something that needed to be addressed. Okay, one aspect I think um, what needs further work on is developing the storytelling skills. Often um, artefacts are uploaded and, but there's not a lot of content or background to it or it might be very factual but there's nothing that really engages an audience that they would find interesting. And often the cultural context is not there. And I think the key thing about um, culture, like a heritage in Vietnam, it's a living heritage. It's living culture. Like, say, Van Mio, for instance, isn't um, just a, a building that's frozen in time. Students still go there and ask for good luck in their exams. People graduate and they're going to take photos. So it's a, a living heritage, which I think is one of the really key features, which I think can be taken into this storytelling. Okay. So again, so it gives you some of the ideas of the barriers. Okay. And one interesting particularly is outdated stereotypes. And by coming up with these kind of social design solutions that we achieved with the museums, it meant that Vietnamese cultural professionals were taking back that kind of power to tell their own stories instead of having, often when you search, do a search for Vietnam, very quickly you come to an American perspective, for example, on Vietnam. Okay. So, so it's very pragmatic. So it's using what you have now, okay? This approach. Okay, and the main thing is it's accessible, inclusive, networking. It involves a lot of partnerships because you can't do it alone. So that's where hopefully today you'll have met someone that you haven't met before, okay? So these kinds of opportunities that present a great thing for you to do. Um, okay, so here's an example of some of what we did. So digitising so some of the betel nut collection, which you can see in the museum here. So that's now digitised um, and this low cost approach, um, we probably could digitise around 65% and it was just using smartphones and easily available um, programs, apps and platforms, okay? Um, and some of them, um, like this, this one, it looks very small here, but it's three and a half, or no, 3.12 metres high. That where we did have a little bit of money from the university, we could hire a proper scanning company to do that because that was beyond our capacity. But that's where, by able to do 65% of it free and train the museum staff to do it, it was a huge saving and meant that it was uploaded and it was done within a month and it was accessible to the public. So if you want, you can have a look at more of this sketch. It's on Sketchfab and that's the Vietnamese Women's Museum Betel Nut Collection. So you can have a look at that content that's online. So, and this kind of thing, it's something that um, everyone were here with a phone in the room that you would be able to do. Okay, so as I said, not all artefacts could be scanned, but again, it was a very interesting learning curve. And we were able to digitise this one and a really large double-sided uh, standing screen that they also have at the Vietnam Fine Arts Museum. Okay. Okay, so this is from my colleague Harbu for translation. So getting an idea of that kind of, you know, hacking <laughs> kind of approach, okay? Okay, and an example, you see it all the time, I think, and that's why I'm very inspired by when I'm going around this street setting. As you can see, people are already applying these kinds of practical, 
kind of making it work skills. So for example, the plastic bottle that's protecting a light from the rain. So it's something I think really strong culturally and I think we can really harness it more in whatever creative area we're working in, in terms of creative intelligence and coming up with great design solutions, whatever we're doing. Okay, and for me, I've been starting to think because we have, you know, generative AI. So I'm wondering, like, uh, what uh, cultural artefacts and heritage on Vietnam is in international collections? So I looked at um, recently the Victorian Albert in London, and they had at least 40 artefacts from Vietnam. So in some ways, ideally, they'd be repatriated back physically. But if that's not possible, there might be ways that they can be curated and used to enhance collections that we have in Vietnam by making those links. Um, also with um, RMIT Vietnam, for our design studies students, I really want to develop a Vietnam design archive because we have a, a design archive in Melbourne for Australia and I really want to have that for our students here because there's such a lot of brilliant design happening in Vietnam, but it's maybe not necessarily archived, particularly contemporary design. And then also ongoing, more of the dissemination of the Future Ancestors project, having the, um, all the workshops freely available for people to watch the recordings and participate, and we want to make that a bit more interactive. Okay, so the main key thing, so encouraging development of low cost or no cost kind of solutions, not waiting for the perfect time, whether it's the perfect people, the perfect money, whatever it is, the perfect technologies. Um, coming up with a hack or a solution for how you can do it now. Um, and then also looking for representation, different viewpoints, and really engaging with the communities, okay? and in terms of inclusion and access. And then the collaborat collaborative partnerships, again, for fostering the digital um, inclusion. And that's where, particularly when the opportunity came up to work with Melbourne, the lecturers and students, I went, ah, you know, it was a great opportunity. So it's keeping your little spidey sense aware for those great kind of possibilities that you can find, okay? And then culturally relevant digitization practices, okay? What works in one country, you just can't copy paste and bring it here into Vietnam. And I'm looking forward to the time that people copy paste things from Vietnam to take it overseas. Because I think there's a lot of really good things happening here that really be, need to be communicated. Okay, so I would advocate for more of these kind of social design, participatory, interdisciplinary kind of projects. Because th to me, that's the way to go to really harness everybody's creative intelligence rather than just relying on an individual. Okay, I just, it doesn't really, to me, work very successfully anymore. You need teams. Okay, and I think um, what we're doing here, I think can maybe also be of use to other people across the global south. And finally, I'd just like to say we are having a talk show on Thursday and it starts at 9.30 and it, it'll be here and it'll be showing the work in progress that we have from the Future Ancestors Interdisciplinary Studio. So if that's something, you're, if you're interested in to see what the um, 30 plus students and their lecturers have been doing over the last, by that stage, two weeks. Please, very welcome to come and have a look at what they're thinking Hanoi might be like in 25 years' time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so, so much, Michelle. What a great way to open our event. Um, the thing that I particularly thought that it was a little bit, um, you know, under, not undervalued, but you should have really owned the fact of your contribution. Like, it is so amazing. We always hear of the things coming out of COVID that are negative, and now you're like, wow, we've actually, you know, found this opportunity. Like, you know, there's something that doesn't actually work within our sector. 
and it was through a collaboration of like like-minded people that saw this as an opportunity to go hey look let's really jump on board and see what we can do and that's just amazing the progress that you're making and things you're doing so well done yeah thank you and thank you for sharing okay so now I'm going to invite who I would consider to be RMIT royalty because there's a little bit of a background story here. So when we first started to discuss this symposium and we're talking about future heritage, I asked some of the, my colleagues at work that were more familiar with people in um, Hanoi and I'm like, who would you get to talk at this event? And all I heard <laughs> was... Taovu, 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 Taovu. So she is like literally our royalty and I'm um, so excited to be able to introduce you, Tao, because this is amazing. Um, so for those of you that do not know um, Taovu, Taovu is from Kilomet 109 and she's just a rock star and I think that you really, another one that really deserves to be honoured and praised and we're very lucky to have you to come and speak with us today. Um, so um, so Taovu is... Uh, how would I say? So she's founder, director, lead designer, <laughs> everything under the sun that's instigated in Kilomet 109. Uh, she does amazing work around fashion. She, uh, she um, is, when talking about future heritage, going into um, the communities, bringing in traditional uh, handicrafts techniques, dyeing techniques, bringing it into back into a contemporary approach to looking at fashion design. It's all just amazing, 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 amazing. So we are so looking forward to hearing what well, I am so looking at, and so are these guys as well. But welcome to the stage, Tao, and thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, um, for the kind uh, introductions. <clears throat> um, but I think I'm going to go back to my mother tongue to present this. Um, uh, so please, uh, the English spoken audience. Um, yeah. Um, so, to Michelle, thank you for the presentation. It's wonderful. And I totally agree and believe that our future heritage is all about uh, flexibility um, and it's it's um, it heavily embed in our design thinking to um, the actual products xin cảm ơn chị Michelle bởi vì cái bài trình bày của chị cũng làm cho tôi thì càng tin tưởng hơn uh, vào cái di sản tương lai uh, đó là cái sự linh hoạt um, cái sự ứng biến uh, trong thiết kế và riêng về linh hoạt thì người Việt Nam chắc chắn là số 1 uh, giống như là uh, khi các bạn uh, nước ngoài thì đến Việt Nam và nhìn thấy cái cảnh tượng uh, giao thông thì thấy nó hỗn loạn thế nhưng mà đấy cũng là một trong những hình ảnh đầu tiên để um, để nói được cái, cái, cái tính linh hoạt của người Việt um, à, Tuy nhiên thì trong ngày hôm nay um, tôi muốn lôi kéo các bạn uh, quay lại uh, với một cái cái, cái, cái tư tưởng uh, cũng rất là người Việt um, đó là là gốc cái gốc um, thì chủ đề của tôi hôm nay là nói về um, thiết kế gốc ạ uh, người Việt Nam thì thường hay dùng uh, từ gốc để để miêu tả một cái trạng thái có cái tính kết nối với cái cái nơi mình sinh ra với cái nguồn gốc của mình mất gốc là một cái gì đấy cũng rất là kinh khủng đối với người Việt nó thể hiện cái trạng thái rất là chơi vơi và bởi vì gốc thì nó là hiện thân cho nguồn cội cho bộ gen văn hóa hay chính là bản sắc vì thế thì trong cái mất gốc thì như là là cái cảm giác là mất căn căn tính này nhận dạng này bản ngã điều này tương tự với sáng tạo các bạn ạ nhất là trong thời điểm bùng nổ toàn cầu hóa rồi là tiêu dùng siêu tốc sự suy thái môi trường và khủng hoảng xã hội thì thiết kế có gốc là có những cái tác động uh, gì đến xã hội uh, nó ảnh hưởng như thế nào đến vai trò của các nhà thiết kế và nó nó có tác động như thế nào trong việc định hình về di sản tương lai <cười> uh, 
À, đối với đối với tôi thương hiệu tất cả các thương hiệu thiết kế ngày nay thực ra là những cái hình thức phong phú của văn hóa dân gian. À, mọi người chọn những thương hiệu khác nhau à, để phản ánh cái niềm tin, à, để phản ánh cái quan điểm chính trị à, hoặc là cái bản ngã của họ. À, toàn cầu hóa ở ở trong à, nhất là trong ngành công nghiệp à, thiết kế thì à, rõ ràng là mang lại rất nhiều lợi ích à, trong đó là tạo công an việc làm. À, sinh kế à, rồi là đảm bảo thu nhập à, sự bình ổn về à, đời sống vật chất à, cho tất cả chúng ta à, tuy nhiên thì nó vẫn có những cái mặt trái của nó à, trong đó đến nó ảnh hưởng đến cái tiếng nói độc lập à, cái tính độc đáo à, của cái tính bản sắc của mỗi thương hiệu à, vì vậy mọi người thì đang tìm kiếm những cái thương hiệu à, nguyên bản đại diện cho một đối tượng văn hóa cụ thể nào đó hoặc là cho một thời kỳ, hoặc một cái địa điểm, hoặc một cái nơi trốn nào đó để 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 để, để thể hiện được các cái 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 mong mong mỏi cái um, uh, cái trợ, cái sự trông mong của mình uh, để phản ánh được những cái nhu cầu uh, và cái ước muốn của mình thông qua cái thương hiệu đấy uh, thiết kế uh, có gốc thì có khả năng kết nối với các cái gì giá trị cũ À, rõ ràng rồi <cười> vì gốc mà nhưng điều đó cũng không có nghĩa là nó không có kết nối với những cái giá trị mới à, <cười> thì đối với tôi thì các cái thiết kế có gốc thì nó không chỉ um, đảm bảo được cái cái tính kết nối với các cái giá trị đã sẵn có mà nó còn giải quyết được những vấn đề hiện nay của xã hội à, Thiết kế có gốc đối với tôi thì nó um, có khả năng là tạo ra một cái, uh, cái chuỗi uh, sản xuất mang tính tuần hoàn. Uh, tôi ví dụ uh, đây là những cái hình ảnh uh, tôi đã uh, tư, uh, ghi lại khi mà làm việc với nhóm Lào ở Điện Biên. Uh, và tất cả các cái uh, thành phần nguyên liệu thì nó đều uh, nó là một cái vòng tròn tuần hoàn uh, và khép kín. À, trong đó là từ nguyên liệu à, sợi à, ví dụ như nhóm này là một trong những nhóm thì chủ động hoàn toàn à, kể về cái khâu sản xuất à, từ nguyên liệu thô ví dụ như là trồng bông có hai giống bông thì họ trồng à, ngoài ra có cả tơ tằm rồi còn hai loại tơ tằm là tơ tằm à, dâu và tơ tằm à, sắn à, thế nên, và ngoài ra nữa là họ à, cái khả năng à, của các cộng đồng bản địa thì họ có khả năng tối đa hóa rất hiệu quả các cái à, nguồn nguyên liệu cũng như là các cái chất liệu địa phương ngay ở trong cái môi trường sống của họ. Ừ. Ups, sao lại nhanh thế nhỉ? Xin lỗi các bạn. <cười> à, à, cái thiết kế có gốc thì nó có khả năng à, giải quyết à, các cái vấn đề trong xã hội à, như tôi đã chia sẻ từ lúc đầu à, nó tăng à, nó ổn định được cái à, nguồn lao động địa phương à, người dân địa phương nhất là các cái à, nhất là các nghệ nhân địa phương thì không cần phải phải tìm kiếm tìm kiếm các cái công việc ở các cái thành phố lớn mà thay vì đó thì họ đã họ họ vì họ có khả năng để để sống với cái nghề truyền thống của họ thì họ sẽ quyết định ở lại địa phương và cái việc này cũng cải thiện và ổn định hóa được cái sinh kế của đồng bào À, ngoài ra là thiết kế có gốc thì uh, có khả năng để um, hỗ trợ trong cái việc bảo tồn uh, văn hóa rất là hiệu quả À, nó à, ngoài ra cái 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 chu trình à, của các cái thiết kế có gốc à, mà theo các cái chu trình chế tác truyền thống ấy, à, thì nó lại à, đảm bảo được cái sự tác động nó à, tối thiểu hóa cái sự tác động à, tiêu cực đến môi trường xung quanh à, tất cả các cái cộng đồng mà tôi làm việc cho thương hiệu km một trăm chín bây giờ là bảy bảy nhóm cộng đồng à, khác nhau trong đó có à, các nhóm dân tộc thiểu số à, thuộc miền núi phía bắc rồi là à, miền Nam, à, miền à, đồng bằng sông Cửu Long và à, miền Nam Tây Nguyên à, thì họ đều à, sử dụng các cái nguyên liệu tại địa phương và cái việc à, địa phương hóa tối đa này nó cũng đã giảm thiểu rất nhiều à, cái việc phát thải à, rồi là à, rác thải à, và ngoài ra nữa là họ à, không cần phải sử dụng các cái nguyên liệu nhập khẩu thì cái giá thành à, để sản xuất nó cũng giảm đi rất nhiều. 
và chế tác theo các cái phương pháp truyền thống thì họ thường là làm việc theo một cái nhóm hoặc một cộng đồng tôi đơn cử lấy một cái ví dụ là trong cái chu trình dệt vải chẳng hạn để làm một cái cái khâu căng sợi thôi whooping ấy thì thì các nhóm cộng đồng hầu như là làm việc theo nhóm với nhau và cái này rất là quan trọng trong cái việc mà thực hành các cái văn hóa truyền thống bởi vì cái việc làm việc theo nhóm này nó đảm bảo sự gắn kết trong cộng đồng ngoài ra nữa nó cũng là một cái group therapy rất là hiệu quả vì khi mà tôi làm việc với các cộng đồng thì khi mà làm việc với nhóm cũng là cái dịp mà các chị em các nghệ nhân thì có thể chia sẻ những cái vấn đề của gia đình của cộng đồng với nhau và cái điều này tôi cho rằng là nó đang giải quyết thêm một 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 cái nấc nữa trong việc là đã có một cái sự Um, chăm ẵm uh, cái tâm lý của cộng đồng rất là hiệu quả um, <cười> uh, đây là những cái mà mà tôi uh, um, Tôi chia sẻ với các bạn vừa rồi, à, lúc nãy tôi đã nhảy cái slide này nhanh quá, <cười> à, đang tay nhìn. À, thế nhưng đây, à, đây là một trong những cái thiết kế mà mà sau sau khi à, cái chu trình à, sản xuất khép kín đó, thì đây là một trong những thiết kế mà chúng tôi đã à, sử dụng các cái chất liệu à, của nhóm cộng đồng Lào. Để các bạn thấy được rằng là cái chu trình khép kín và chu trình tuần hoàn à, trong thiết kế có gốc, à, nó có những cái tác động rất là tích cực đến việc ổn định xã hội, ổn định cộng đồng địa phương, ổn định kinh tế địa phương và ngoài ra nữa nó là một cái cái phương thức để bảo tồn văn hóa địa phương rất là hiệu quả. Đồng thời cũng 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 có khả năng để để tác động đến cái 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 sự phản ứng của xã hội bên ngoài đối với các cái cái, cái thiết kế địa phương và lôi kéo có khả năng lôi kéo xã hội để cùng cùng chung sức với cộng đồng địa phương trong việc bảo tồn văn hóa địa phương à, và à, ngoài à, địa phương cụ thể là địa phương ngoài ra thì cũng bảo tồn văn hóa à, cái tính đa dạng văn hóa à, của cụ thể là Việt Nam à, với cái việc à, tiếp cận à, theo cái hướng à, thiết kế có gốc như thế này à, đối với tôi thì à, thiết kế có khả năng để 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 gợi ra một cái để gợi, um, À, có một cái sự kết nối à, rất là cụ thể về một cái nôi chớn cụ thể nào đó à, thì cái thiết kế có gốc là cái thiết kế đã làm được cái phần việc này rất là tốt à, thiết kế có gốc thì cũng có khả năng là à, kết nối với các cái giá trị cũ à, ngoài ra nữa thì nó có khả năng để à, tham gia vào cái công việc là giải quyết các cái vấn đề à, luôn luôn thay đổi của xã hội À, đây chính là cái phần mà tôi muốn à, dừng lại. À, đây cũng là cái slide cuối cùng à, để tôi à, muốn thể hiện là thiết kế có gốc là một trong những cái thiết kế mà trong tương lai à, nó sẽ có cái tác động rất lớn trong việc à, à, duy trì à, các cái di sản à, văn hóa và cũng là một cái hướng mà chúng ta à, phát triển sử dụng à, digitalize hay là à, tất cả những cái phương thức phát triển hoặc là những cái à, công nghệ mới à, thì cái có gốc vẫn là một cái điều mà chúng ta luôn luôn cần phải duy trì. À, xin cảm ơn à, mọi người đã lắng nghe. Uh, thank you very much, Tao. I think that was a really interesting presentation, and I'm, I'm sure there will be more questions coming up about that later on. Really exciting. Um, It's a great honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Alison Bennett, who's here from um, RMIT Melbourne. And um, Alison is um, uh, both an artist and academic whose practice is rooted in something that can be called expanded photography, um, which is um, yeah, like playing with all kinds of technology to see what is photography beyond photography. And um, their work has been uh, shown internationally in museums around the world, like the Louvre or uh, in Germany, in my hometown in Bonn, actually. Unfortunately, I didn't see that exhibition, but still quite exciting. Um, in San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and also published internationally, for example, in the New York Times or uh, BuzzFeed or The Guardian. And um, Dr. Bennett leads the photography discipline as, at RMIT as well as um, a co-lead at the RMIT Imaging Futures Lab, and um, yeah, I'd just like to hand over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christian. I'm going to use a timer so I can keep track of what I'm, where I'm going. All right. So let's see. Um, we must be good ancestors too. Uh, this is a, a line from a, a Maori musician, Stan Walker, who I rather admire. Um, and it was largely prompted by Michelle's theme of future ancestors, uh, which is such a beautiful, a beautiful proposition, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, so I want to talk about time travel, essentially. Uh, and I'm going to make a bit of a proposition about time travel. But firstly, I've got... This is me. Um, this is my website if you want to find out anything more about me and what I do and what I've done. And I'll be touching a little bit on this idea of expanded photography. Um, there's uh, this kind of photography before the iPhone and photography after the iPhone and the way that that changed the way that we interact with photography practice and images. Um, we've gone from uh, photography being separate from, the, from everyday life to these devices that we have in our pockets that we can take a photograph and share it within seconds and suddenly there's this sort of uh, flow of images around us at all times. Um, but I'm also gonna touch a little bit on the expansion of photography, not just in terms of its ubiquity and the complete sort of flood of images around us, but also the shift from being an isolated 2D frame to being a artifact that is 3D. So the 3D scanning that Michelle's working with is very much part of this expanded photography discourse. So, <clears throat> What if we are already time traveling? Like what, what if this flow of moments that we're in is actually a form of time travel? Um, I always think of science fiction movies where they have discovered time travel and there's this terrible concern that if you go back in time, the smallest action that you take can have massive outcomes into the future. What if that's already happening? Because this is, this is the reality of every choice that we make is time travel. It's having impact on the future generations that come ahead of us. So I was actually in Hanoi uh, 30 years ago. I was here around uh, 1993 for a conference on architectural heritage. And uh, coming back 30 years later, it, I kind of feel like I've stepped out of a time machine into another reality, but some things are still the same. The traffic is still the same. Um, when, I was, when I was here 30 years ago, there were almost no cars at all. Um, and I remember the first time I had to cross the road, getting, learning to trust the flow of the traffic and that I could step out into the traffic and people would just move around me. Um, I have a very strong memory of looking at my hotel room at night time and seeing a small toddler walking through the middle of the traffic. Christian's looking a little alarmed. And people were just, were not, were not at all stressed about it. Um, and although we're now immersed in cars, there's still the same approach that Michelle described of let's just work around each other and make it work, yeah? So there's this sort of cultural continuity that I'm feeling, even though I've stepped out of a time machine 30 years later. So I'm here working on a project called Future Ancestors. It's a collaboration between um, the Vietnam campus and Hanoi campus of Vietnam RMIT and um, myself and my colleagues from the Melbourne campus. We're based in the School of Art. And we've been divided up into three essential projects. Um, Alan and Tao are going to talk about their projects. I'm working with uh, Paul Antoine Lucas and Andres Puy on a project we're calling Extending Heritage. So we're working with uh, Hanoi Ad Hoc, the fantastic Hanoi Ad Hoc, um, to look at typologies of architecture, 
many of which are under threat and are vulnerable. And we're exploring different types of imaging technologies and how we might uh, translate that into other, other forms. And there's a number of questions that we're thinking about through this. One of the principles we're working with is being student-led. This is a principle that's been developed very, very strongly by my colleague, Dr. Alan Hill, who was speaking later. But we're, we're not telling the students how to interpret what they're seeing. We're providing them with problems. We're working with a partner. And we're giving them a range of different approaches and technologies and things that they could play with. But we're asking them to propose solutions because they are standing on our shoulders. They're going to travel further in time than we can. And we want to develop them to feel confident and uh, empowered in the choices that they're making to create their future. I'm particularly impressed with Hanoi Ad Hoc and this idea of, of ad hocism, which is the practice of rea reacting to what happens or what is needed at a particular time. So rather than a house being, um, us being tied to what a house dictates, that what we're seeing a lot of, as we can see in this little photograph here, I'll explain in a moment, is um, the way that we see people adapting their houses. So although the house might have been built for a particular type of lifestyle, uh, people are finding ways to adapt and um, f improvise around that structure. So this is on a veranda of a house we visited that was built that had no running water or bath or, or bathing facilities. And so it's a little bathroom that's been built on a veranda. So I thought that was a, a lovely example of uh, ad hocism. Um, before I move to the next slide, I just want to talk about um, this idea that was given to us by Professor Amar Gala, um, who is, was very involved with UNESCO here in Vietnam in the 90s. And I, we asked him, how do you define heritage? And he defined it as a map written on the land. Um, and I've been speculating as to what he might have meant by that. And what I've been thinking about is the ideas that Trung from Hanoi Ad Hoc has been giving us, which, where he talks about the ideologies that inform the manufacture and shaping of the architecture that we've seen, but also the performative manifestation. So performativity is a concept where things are formed through repetition. So it's not just a, a set and forget idea. The, sh the shape of the things that we use change over time because of how we use them. I, this is a very early example of some of the work we've been doing. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you the movement of it. This is actually a 3D model that was built from photographs that we took on day three of our visit here. It uh, and. Paul Antoine, maybe you can help me correctly pronounce the typology of the house we were looking at, with the, the, the socialist housing. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry, I, I won't repeat it because I'll get it. I'll get that very wrong. But it's a piece of socialist housing built in uh, the 1950s, and uh, it's been through a number of iterations. And there's some really complex questions that came up through looking at this house. Um, and, and it really reiterates a lot of the questions that I've put up here. What does it mean to make a digital copy? Like, it, it's, it's not a copy, it's an it's a impression. There's so much about a physical object that we cannot capture in digital form or in photography. There's so much materiality, there's a smell, there's the physical experience of moving through a space, there's a touch of it, there's the temperature of the space. But we're asking, what does this do to the, to the value of these places? Does making the sort of digitalization of these spaces actually extend and share the, what's valuable about the place? Or does it actually make it more vulnerable? There's a possibility that if we make this sort of documentation of a house, that it might be 
thought, okay, we've made a copy, we can demolish it and we don't need to, to preserve it because it's been documented. Or maybe by um, creating these 3D models we place on the internet um, that will actually share and extend the reach and understanding of the cultural moments that led to these particular manifestations of domestic space. So, some complex questions. We don't have the answers yet and I'm really looking forward to hearing what the students come up with at the end of the two weeks. They're being very graciously led by Paul Antoine who's asking lots of really gentle, probing, encouraging questions to the students. I'm going to talk about uh, this project very briefly and then show you one of my own projects because I, I'm not here to tell you how to do things. I'm here to tell you about what I think is interesting and what I've discovered through my own practice and try to share my enthusiasm with you. Um, this, this is a project that was originally called Project Mosul and it arose around 2015 um, and it was a group of uh, people who witnessed the destruction of the museum artefacts in the Mosul Museum. And because they un understood photogrammetry, which is the, a technique for building 3D models from photographs, they decided to use the videos that were broadcast of the objects being destroyed and took stills of the objects from those videos and they were able to rebuild digital models of those artefacts. And they've actually built an entire online museum that recreates the, the galleries and objects that were in that museum that were destroyed. But it's grown from that particular moment to a much bigger project where they've got uh, crowdsourced images from around the world. The images are being provided by uh, tourists, soldiers, aid workers, locals. So it's not one person who's driving or contributing the images. It's actually a crowdsourced project um, and it's an ongoing project. So not only are they contributing photographs, but people are also contributing their expertise and their computer power to render these photographs into models and then share them back online. So it's a very much um, uh, a very 21st century idea of photography. It's not a single person, it's actually a crowdsourced, collaborative, almost like a swarm, the view of the swarm rather than the individual. So I'm going to conclude by telling you a little bit about uh, one of the projects that inspired me to uh, put my hand up and be involved with the Future Ancestors project. Not only was I um, very excited at the idea of coming back to Hanoi, it's one of the most exciting cities I've ever visited. Um, I wanted to tell you about this project and I think there are some uh, things coming out of this I'd like to share with the students and with my colleagues here for us to think about. So I grew up on the lands of the Biripai, um, actually not far from where Michelle grew up it turns out, um, and on a place called the Bulga Plateau. The Bulga Plateau is very high up on the mountain range. Um, it's a small country town of about 200 people and Bulga literally means waterfall. Everything comes to this point on the, the plateau, all the water, all the countryside leads to this waterfall. And so this has become a uh, my psychological centre. One of the ideas I want to put out to you today is not to separate the cultural, the technological and the ecological. All of these things are interconnected, yeah? Um, so the idea that the culture, culture is separate from ecology or that ecology is separate from technology I think is not a very useful separation. These things are deeply interconnected and feed each other. Um, so I, grew, I, I left here when I was 15 and I still dream about this landscape. This is a depth map of the landscape. So in addition to this photograph showing you the valley and the waterfall, I also um, was able to download the uh, topology of the site 
and to build a 3D model. This is just a screenshot. This actually resides on Sketchfab, so we can get in there and move it around and get a sense of the lay of the land. But I um, had this very strong urge to go back and um, make a project about the houses that I grew up in in this countryside. So um, there was a very particular approach to architecture in this place. It was a, a practice of do-it-yourself. Most of the houses were built by the people who lived in them. And they were built under quite um, uh, basic conditions using recycled materials. Um, you would start with a single room and it would get cold so you'd put in a fireplace and you'd put in walls and you'd have a child so you'd build another room. So these houses evolved with the families that lived in them. Um, and I had this idea that I would go there and have this sort of very profound encounter with these spaces and then go back out into the world and share that. And then COVID happened. So um, I couldn't travel. The time that and the money that I'd put together to go and do this project, I wasn't allowed to leave my house, essentially. So in Melbourne, we were allowed out for one hour a day within a five kilometre bubble. Um, so what I ended up doing was teaching people that still lived in the town. It's a small town of about 200 people. I reached out to people I still had contact with and explained what I was trying to do. And they then took their cameras and created the data capture that I needed and then sent me a hard drive of photographs that I was then able to construct into these 3D spaces. So I've put up some QR codes that will take you to the models on Sketchfab, but I'm about to show you a video that shows you uh, part of how the work was exhibited in a gallery space. I'm just going to change the thing. Could we play the video, please? Yeah. So this is a, a building we call the barn. It uh, was down in the Ellenborough Valley and uh, no car access. It was built by literally dragging the materials down down a slope of a mountain. So there was no car access to bring the materials in to build this. Um, it was built by a guy called Rick Reynolds. Um, and uh, it was this was photographed by his daughter, Una Ray. Um, and I have very profound memories of this house as a child. It's this beautiful open plan space next to a river. Um, in school holidays, uh, we would have a, a children's camp, so all of the kids who were on school holiday would just walk down into the valley and set up camp around this house. Uh, we'd swim in the river, we'd cook together. It was a, a very important place in our lives. Um, so this model can be experienced in VR. So you go into a VR headset and you can actually literally walk around inside the space. Um, I, I want to share, uh, I'm going to conclude with sharing that this house actually burnt down a few months ago. So we, we had, did have plans to set it up as a, an artist's residency retreat, but unfortunately that particular future is no longer available to us. Um, climate change has meant that there's a lot more bushfires through this part of the country. And so this particular space no longer exists, so it's now part of this sort of uh, lost cultural heritage, but we still have this particular moment. And the last idea I'm going to leave you with is rather than simply having the idea that a photograph as a documentation needs to be accurate, we can also, the value of creative and speculative interpretations of um, places is also extremely valuable to understanding the significance of a place. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. So um, it's like when you're listening, you're always look, thinking of these questions that are coming to mind and there are just so many thought-provoking, like further 
questions that I want to ask, particularly around this notion where it was so interesting. You started about questioning this notion of time and the future, and then you brought it back into memory and talking about this relation, this inherent relationship with memory and heritage and future heritage. And it's like it's so it's really really fascinating. So I look forward to the questions that are actually going to come about that. Okay, so we have our next speaker. So this is uh, Nguyen uh, Dui An from Baobao Airspace. Come to the floor, my friend. We are very excited to have you here. So Nguyen Dui An is a queer moving image artist based in Vietnam, uh, graduated with a degree in film direction uh, from a four-year exchange program between Hanoi Academy of Theatre and Cinema and also in uh, INSAS in Belgium. So his work explores and questions the domination of larger systems to the expressive freedom of individuals in contemporary social contexts. So on top of that, in 2022, he became a member of Baba Airspace, um, where he's founded the Hua Quinn Cinema, focusing on organizing community cinema activities, as well as producing movie image works. So in um, concurrent with the, some of the, the themes that we've been listening to today, so one of the really interesting things is when we're talking about Baba Airspace, is it really fosters and celebrates the collegiality between um, between community practitioners, artists, curators, you know, just the overall creative community here in, in Vietnam in a really safe, nurturing, open, uh, um, conducive to creativity space. So it's, um, I'm super excited to be able to see this presentation and we really um, love having you here and over to you. Sorry, I need a chair. I have a really back pain, Gen Z. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, um, I would love to present Baboya work in this Future Heritage Symposium. In the limit of 15 minute uh, presentation, I cannot cover all of aspect of Babo. So I will focus mostly on one of our program, core program, which um, I very like in charge of, is Hua Quinn Cinema, and how the format of screening and video can go along with Babo idea of creating sense of belonging, claiming shared ownership, and how it relates to the topic of today, future heritage. Um, um, first of all, my name is Nguyen Zuyang. Uh, I'm a moving image artist based in Hanoi. After graduation, I have been practiced in independently uh, from fiction to documentary, video installation, and working with uh, virus organization. Um, you can see some image of uh, an information of my work here. Um, so there's a very important turn in my career in 2022 is um, I become a part of Bubble Air, Bubble Collective, and I found Hua Quinn, uh, Cinema. So today I'm here to share this story with you guys. Um, so first of all, uh, what is Bubble Air? Uh, what, what is Bubble in general? Many people have given us this question. Firstly, uh, we have Bubble Air. Bubble Air is a space. Founded in 2019, Bubble has been a flexible and a fluid space. It located inside a house in the center of Hanoi only five minutes away from here, very close, um, is a house, not a gallery, but it's more than just a house. When we arrived to the space, we tried to design every corner of the house to be uh, multifunctional and interchangeable. For example, in one room, it can be the bedroom for artists in residency today, but tomorrow it can be a studio, it can be a stage, and also can be a cinema. Um, some people tell us the space is queer and it's queer to its core not because of the people who run it, but also like because the space is designed and it keeps changing and adapting new identity which, um, th throughout the history of, of, of the working. Um, so imagine this is how we um, built, uh, designed the space, but how we operate it. Uh, we operate it as an intimate safe space with non-gatekeeping approach as a way to open it and encourage conversation and collaboration across anyone. So in short, it can be understood like it's a 
micro laboratory for multidisciplinary. And uh, <laughs> this is uh, Babo Collective. Um, this is us. We have a visual artist, curator, producer, filmmaker, uh, olfactory artist, and sometimes each person wear more than just one hat. So together we're running Bubble Air, as mentioned before, as well as curate, producer, and make artwork and community-based art project together. This is some image of our uh, highlight work. Uh, this is our work in uh, Documenta 15 in Germany. And this is uh, our group exhibition last year, like right out there in the Women Museum. Yep. Okay. So in Vietnam, Vietnamese culture, we have a word called uh, Zuyen, which can briefly be translated as like a predestiny encounter. So in Eastern culture in general, this term can be interchangeable for a reason, as an encounter without knowing prior. So we believe Zuyen is widely practiced in Vietnamese life and also in Babo ways of running. We believe everything happened for a reason. Uh, why we're here together with these certain people, not with the other billion people around in the earth. So if we have like got the Zuyen together, why we don't turn this opportunity of knowing each, o knowing each other into something bigger than that? Um, so how Zuyen can apply to the sense of belonging and a sense of ownership? Um, first of all, to, encounter, to encourage the sense of belonging, uh, we think the space needs to be accessible first. Um, unfortunately, we cannot be accessible for everyone because of the capacity of the space and human. Um, accessibility means different to us. Um, as not original, as like all of us not original from the art community or have a visual art background, we used to have struggle in joining in, in the art community. So as an outsider, we do understand um, in the sense which lack of roles everyone needs to play more than just one role. So sometimes I think the communication with the audience is not in priority. So we decide to be a non-gatekeeping art space to welcome any enthusiasts or people with high curiosity and respect. Well, non-gatekeeping doesn't mean there's no gate. It means that you will have to have the key if your heart's with it. Uh, we increase accessibility by first placing the key at the if you know, you know place. We put a box in top of our refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, secondly, we do like produce like uh, a virus keys as a keychain, keychain as an art, our artwork, and we we sell it. <laughs> Um, so even though Babo from 2022 as an audience, it's not up until beginning of 2020 to I start to become a part of Babo residency artist community accidentally because at that time I worked with Babo Air as a collaborator and Taling suddenly got COVID so I like have to quarantine inside the space for two weeks. So that's why we have to live together. So during this... <laughs> During this two week, we, uh, we live, we work, we cook together, we talk, we take care of each other physically and mentally. So I gradually realized that like, the knowledge was being generated and circulated from everyday life encounter is very, is, is very real. So um, being in the house cannot exclude doing house chore, right? So we doing monthly how sure is a way that we experiment to engage with others and observe how others engage with the house. We encourage any space user to join cleaning and re-innovative session. Um, and from the very do domestic setting and discussion, anyone can have a chance to design the space by themselves. Um, this acti activities uh, also increase a sense of belonging and ownership from the user to the space. Okay, um, throughout Babo program, participation of audience is highly encouraged. From a small idea, it can be experiment with larger group and might become a project with the support of Babo. So let me tell you the story about Hakwing. Insomnia used to be my friend. 
And as a filmmaker, I have a huge need to watch film every night. So luckily, Babo has a quite good projector, and <laughs> which is like was donated from Yasan. And from time to time, like uh, Babo people keep eager me to to encourage me to use that projector to screen things that I want to watch, and then uh, everybody can watch it with me, and we uh, discuss with each other. So since then, Nga, another collective member of Babo, and I decided to change one of the room in the house to turn into a micro-intimate cinema. A private screening become a series of screening for a community. Uh, we named this micro-cinema Hoa Quỳnh Cinema. Hoa Quỳnh means a uh, night-blooming service or queen of a night, a flower that can only bloom and shine in the dark. So Hoa Quỳnh Cinema become the film department of Babao, focused on organizing uh, moving image related activities, program, and we do production also. So in our first three months, we organized a handful of screening with curation from me and Nga. Um, we also open up the, to the participation from the audience. We screen anything from art house film to blockbuster to music video, video art. Sometimes we even screen a concert and just like TV advertisement. So, I mean, anything that, be, that we want to screen and our audience want to screen, we can just like share it together. So along like six hours of screening every night from like midnight till dawn, uh, f from, from that we co-programming, we co-learning, and we learn from each other. So from screening, orig organically we uh, engage to our personal practice interwoven with each other with and from Hawking Cinema. For example, my short film last year was produced by Nga, uh, a collective member of, of Hawking and many others uh, film crew member was actually like Hoa Quỳnh audience. Um, from screening, Hoa Quỳnh become a platform of co-habitat with Babo Air, and under Babo Air, at the same time beyond the physical body of Babo Air, it create many opportunity for us to meet filmmaker and film organizer around the world. So beyond screening, Hoa Quỳnh introduced to its audience and community the work of independent filmmaker in the region. Um, screening also become a medium to discuss culture and social issues. For example, we open up a collaboration with other anthropology screening, or like last week we have a Palestine film screening. As you may see, I for myself becoming from a host, a guest to a host, from a user to become a runner. And now I become a part of the space body. So let's say this diagram is how Babo Air running, no matter physical or non-physical space. We co-run this model by enhancing the community ownership from our activities. But to, to know what is a community ownership, we need to know who is a community and how to develop the sense of ownership inside the community. The second question was answered by my whole presentation, I guess. Uh, by accessibility, co-habitat, and co-programming, um, the, community, the community is a community of user, runner, create. Uh, the community, community do not have the fixed size. It can expand and compress as long as the respiratory of the circle, user, runner, and space keep, uh, keep continue. So the community ownership nurture a safe space for knowing for knowledge production and circulation. So we have a question: What remain? I guess uh, this is a personal legacy of the one who be a part of it, and I guess it can be considered as a future heritage, unknown heritage that we are in the process of building, developing, and disconstruction. So last but not least, this is one of our writing on space. Hope you can nourishing something together with us. You can scan the QR code for the paragraph. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for listening. This is the end of my presentation. And before I end, before <laughs> I come to an end, I would, I would like to show a, a video of how uh, Wakwing Cinema is. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, thank you, uh, Zuyan. Very uh, interesting presentation. I'm sure there will be also many more questions later about this this project and uh, idea of uh, co-living, co-working, co co-creating, and the community uh, beyond that. Uh, with great pleasure now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan Hill, who's uh, another colleague from RMIT Melbourne, um, and also part of the Future Ancestors Project here. Uh, Dr. Alan Hill is a photographer living on unceded Wurundjeri country in North Melbourne, and his um, personal photographic work is primarily exploring um, like topics that are concerned with uh, the politics of public space, um, while his broader research interests revolve around the reconsideration of documentary photography as a civil practice. And yeah, over to you. <laughs> Okay. Xin chào. Can I sit or stand? <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. It's my first time in Hanoi, first time in Vietnam. Um, and I guess I wanted to start out, there's a slide coming with a title on it, but um, for me, it's, I'm here really uh, to learn, not to uh, profess anything in particular, but to, I guess, um, share something of how I came here and, um, and what I've learned along the way and see if there might be, this might be an opportunity to make connections and see if, if, if something is, is useful for you and that we might be able to pick up conversations. So it's been a, an honor and a privilege so far to work with an amazing group of people, some of whom are here also to hear about the the work just in the last the last few talks you know about about rooted design um about um i've forgotten the name already of the collective is baba bas yes so um i think you know i'm um and kind of in awe of the work that's happening here and so um yeah just wanted to reiterate that i'm i'm here to learn more than anything else so the topic um, that I wanted to speak to, though, was um, thinking about creative practice and cultural heritage, which is a kind of new thing for me to think about, basically. So, um, and so I'm grateful for that opportunity as well. Um, in particular, you know, photography is my background, as Christian talked about. And so I guess if I can offer anything, it's some insights from thinking and practicing through photography um, discourses that, you know, um, there are, I think, some interesting things that can be points of connection. So, um, so these are the rough things. Is just going to talk a little bit, spend a little bit of time talking about um, some photography theory, um, talking about a, an idea coming out of that, um, of this, oh, sorry, I'm moving my slides, not these slides. <laughs> photography, the civil, and I'm sorry for my white slides as well, I realize it. If you, wear, if you need to put sunglasses on, that's fine. Um, and then connecting that to future heritage um, or seeing where that might, might connect. So I'm going to move both slides at once now. So um, in particular for me, the thing about photography is, or that I've been doing and kind of grappling with for 20 years or so, is this question of... Um, uh, a, a kind of paradox at the center of photography that often people go into photography with some idea that they have something good to do and that they have good intentions and that there's some there's going to be some positive outcome from photography but also of course it has a very problematic past and problematic history and so it's in trying to work through the complexity of that situation that I think some interesting um, ideas can kind of emerge um, secondly um, I think We've been talking a little bit about, um, and you know, you've heard about this Future Ancestors workshop. I'm working in the photography kind of aspect of that workshop. And we've been thinking about how do we connect photography and, and future heritage. So um, it's interesting to consider that photography um, is, is a new medium. So it, is, it only exists for 150, 60 years. There's no photographs before that. It doesn't have a long heritage in that sense. Um, but and it's also generally, you know, kind of about now. Um, so it doesn't kind of have a natural connection. But then at the same time, 
it's also always future heritage because as soon as you, uh, Alison talked about time travel, so as soon as you freeze a moment in time, it's already heritage, you know, by the next moment. And so, and, and so it's, it automatically is accumulating in that way. Um, so it's a kind of, again, a kind of a, I see that as a paradox that where interesting things can emerge. Where am I up to now? Uh, so just touching on photography, so I'm particularly influenced by a thinker called Ariella Azale, and she um, proposes that photography has had for 150 years the wrong user's manual. Um, and that has been a process for me of quite a few years now, of thinking through uh, you know, her suggestions about what might be a better user's manual for photography. So you can see this idea she has here that for 150 years, it was conceptualized from the perspective of the individual position behind the lens, the one who sees the world shapes it into a photograph of his own creation and displays it to others. And she says that this is, and this is, can be applied to a lot of art discourse as well, that it's all about the image that results, you know, as an object and it's studied and revered. And, and then the creator is the kind of, the, the sole creator of that work. Um, she proposes a different ontology um, which is that um, it's about being together. So it's a relational um, way of being and it, the photograph is a trace of that relation, of that event, of that encounter, rather than an object. So, um, and that it then in that sense, it's not created by one person. It's created by a relationship. It's created by a community of people, including the person who views the photograph at some future point. Um, and so that becomes this different kind of way of thinking about images that, um, yeah, that she theorizes into this idea of civil. So that uh, thinking about photography as a platform rather than an object um, is, yeah, again, something that I'm exploring. So um, related to that, coming out of that, um, she, oh, we've lost the, the heading on that slide, the civil. So this is the sort of second idea that Azale, um, in this, for the purposes of this talk, a second idea that she proposes, which is um, that we have to think about intent, okay? And so she, she proposes this idea of civil intent, which is the interest that citizens display in themselves, in others, and their shared forms of coexistence, as well as in the world that they share, that create and nurture. So this for me was a kind of breakthrough for my thinking, and this was a part of my PhD research, is about those good intentions that photographers often set out with, uh, and how that gets them into problematic territory of trying to do good, um, and, and working in contexts that they don't understand, and um, you know, using the kind of power of the rhetoric of images in problematic ways. Um, but if we can shift that good intention into a bit more of a sophisticated way of thinking about that, into a civil intention, which is about a shared existence, coexistence. Um, and that civil intention is something that um, is not something that you do in isolation. It's not something that happens like, oh, today I'm going to go out and do something. It's a civil project, whereas this today I'm doing a professional project. And she contrasts the civil and the professional. And she kind of critiques professional intent because if you, she says, if you stick to professional intent, if you stick to your area of expertise and your, you know, your, your lane, we talk about stay in your lane, then um, when you lack civil intent, then that's when civil malfunction comes from. This is where, and this is, you know, I think kind of widespread in Western society, right? So this is interesting for me to think about just this morning. I'm like future heritage, right? So my culture's heritage is pretty problematic and our future, if we stay on the current trajectory, is very bleak, right? So Again, this is about learning from other ways of being in the world, which are, you know, quite clearly less less problematic, um, and and that we need to learn from. Uh, so yes, yeah, civil intent has been a kind of big thing for me to work through. So and combining these two things, photography and the civil, has kind of emerged for me as so photography as a platform, and then adopting this idea about an interest in a shared world, is. Um, a, a kind of new framework for me when I'm looking, when I'm teaching, when I'm creating curriculum, when I'm, uh, you know, evaluating whatever it might be, is to be like, 
okay, is this using photography as a platform, if we're talking about photography, is it, or is this creative artwork, is it a platform for a relationship? You know, does it invite that, rather than a kind of uh, exercise in aesthetic appreciation, which is the way we're kind of taught to do art, to read art. How is it a proposing to create a relationship, and how does it propose to kind of uh, operate as a way to have a platform for the relationship, for a shared interest? And so, yeah, it's all about unlearning, basically. So unlearning us the way we're taught to read art in art schools, the way we're taught to kind of lead professional lives where we stick to our particular expertise and we don't stray from that. Um, and so, yeah, this is the kind of new thing that I'm learning and unlearning at the same time. So just, oh, sorry, <laughs> to summarize. So just distinguishing from professional in terms of art and photography, that usually is about aesthetic appreciation and judgments of taste. Um, towards living together. So how does this help us live together, basically? Um, I just put in some images to get away from all those words for a minute, just as a kind of quick examples from my own practice, um, or shared practice with my partner, actually. Um, these are just two examples from a, a long project that we did about extraction, about mining in Queensland, where we lived at the time. Um, this is a kind of an earlier work and very much in a tradition of documentary photography, which, you know, and this work has been acquired by art galleries and museums and exhibited and awarded. It has a kind of direct relationship to uh, photographic histories. You know, it's in the lineage of Alex Soth, which is in the lineage of Walker Evans, which is in the lineage of, right, goes back and back and back. Um, and it's a way of like talking about, it's about labor. Um, and that was our, one of our interests. Um, but it's, you know, it can get caught up in its people talking about the colors and the, you know, and it's got this direct view as well, this kind of understated, like we're just there and we're witnessing this thing. Later in the project, we found a different approach to talk about a similar thing, which was about the way labor is used in mining regions in Queensland. And in this case, it's a kind of different, which is like, it's guess, I guess it's, got a, it's still got a lineage, it's got a kind of anti-aesthetic thing going on. It's not just like a direct view, it doesn't look like you just walk up and see that. But this is the 3,000 keys for the 3,000 bedrooms in a mining camp, which is a temporary structure kind of in the middle of nowhere in Queensland. And that this kind of like extremely alienated way of living and working for us was represented in this, in this approach. And so this was just, I was trying to give one example of like, how we were trying to get these works to operate as a platform, to have a relationship and a discussion and a dialogue about how do we work in this, in the kind of contemporary era, as opposed to some kind of more nostalgic or romantic or, you know, um, that might be found in the other work. So I'm not suggesting there's any one way to do that. Um, I'm not proposing that like photographers take particular approaches. It's more about those criteria of like, is it a platform? Is it demonstrating civil intent? And that's just a detail of those keys. Um, I also do this stuff, which is fascinating. I just put these in because the, um, it's kind of the counterpoint to the traffic the conversations that we have in Hanoi. In Melbourne, the main problem is that people put so many cones out that we kind of have to move around them because they're so worried about us tripping over on, on, um, on you know, anything at all that we, might, we need a warning um, <laughs> that, uh, to stay away. Um, that's right, so that's the front of RMIT in Melbourne pretty much. Um, and the interesting thing for me about these is the laughs that they get. And what happens with these images is people constantly send me their own versions of them. And to me that's evidence that there's like a dialogue going on because people start to observe themselves and they send me their version of it. Um, and so to me that's interesting that it started to change how they see the city and they you know, we can get into, I think, a kind of, I'm interested in like the regime of health and safety, um, which again is a kind of interesting counterpoint. We're working on inner city commute here. Um, this is kind of my commute in a way. Um, so yeah, just little examples. The other place that this plays out for me is in education contexts. So 
I have a day job um, which keeps me fairly busy, so my main creative output goes into like creating classes and courses and trips to Hanoi or trips to Kathmandu. Um, uh, and, and so I'm trying to kind of embed some of these things into those learning spaces. So um, some examples of this. So this is um, a project from pre-COVID, basically, um, where we worked with Photo Circle from Nepal and Patshala in Bangladesh. Uh, and this workshop took place in Kathmandu. This was mostly photography students, but not exclusively. It was interdisciplinary and trying to involve, invite other students from other disciplines into these conversations about the intent, their motivations, and their role, I think. So what role can, you know, do we have, if we want to go to another country, what's our role to be in that country, right? Um, so that we don't, um, and that we need to learn from local partners. So. This is very much, again, about learning from Photo Circle about, um, you know, how, about the visual culture of Nepal, how an Australian student might have something useful to contribute to that, um, and likewise with our Bangladeshi partners. And the same thing we're hoping to do here is to um, learn from the amazing partners that we're working with here and see what, you know, is there something useful we can contribute? Um, while you know, learning and being humble and you know, all those important things. We've also done this um, locally um, last year where we did, or I've now done kind of two courses on thinking about what it means to practice on unceded land. So you know, living in a settler colony in Australia, we have to think about, uh, well, when we, even when we stay home, we're on someone else's country. Uh, and this was a project that we did um, just kind of on RMIT satellite campus, kind of, um, in a local government area which had just changed its name from Moreland, who turned out to be, it was the name of a slave plantation. They just changed their name to Mary Beck, which is the Wurrung word for Rocky Creek, which is the Mary Creek running through the area. And so we did a project, again, interdisciplinary photography, art, fashion, other students, um, collectively thinking about what it means to practice on unceded land and in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander custodianship and that different way of relating to land and place. Um, and again, thinking through roles. Um, so this is just very brief kind of um, insights into what was produced. So these are, sorry, I'm moving the wrong slide. Um, uh, very open-ended, very like non-conclusive pro, um, products and outcomes. So the project was called Fragments of Connection. So the students were able to, rather than present any kind of knowledge or any kind of conclusions out of their learning to say, okay, well, we don't feel connected to this place. We don't, we're not claiming any understanding of this place, but we, you know, we can feel something about it and like, how can we express that and how can we kind of ask more questions and learn more through these processes and projects. So I guess in sort of winding up, um, that's, these are just the, the sort of things I feel like I've gleaned over a few years of thinking about some of these questions. And for me, it's been about now trying to transition some of that stuff into thinking about um, future ancestors and future heritage. Um, and again, thinking about that role. So to me, there's a gap between what happens in like art and creative education, where we again, we're thinking about like photography, thinking about the now, thinking about the new, thinking about like trends and fashions and aesthetic appreciation. Um, so for me, it's a shift to think about heritage upfront, to think about how might this be understood in the future? How does this contribute to a future? But I think for me, Make, there's a quite a clear connection between that civil intention and that idea of future heritage because of course if we have a responsibility to a shared world then we have a responsibility to the future um, as well as obviously to the past. So um, I guess yeah that was where this kind of question came from and the sort of proposal that we put together and put to students and invited them to come into with Michelle, with Alison, with Tao. Um, and the partners um, here is to try and see what we can do to close that gap between creative practice and cultural heritage. And again, 
you know, we're seeing examples of how that's done so beautifully here in Vietnam, and we, we're you know, honored and privileged to be able to be here to learn a bit more about that. Um, as Alison's already pointed to, this was kind of Michelle's prompt about Hanoi in 25 years. Um, but yeah, thinking about getting creative practice, creative practitioners while they're at school, while they're learning, um, to put these questions up front rather than sort of leaving this to art historians to figure out later, um, you know, that we need to foreground some of these questions because they're, I think, urgent and important. So how can we be good ancestors through practice? Um, I'm not sure what else I have to say. Um, uh, this is another, this is just to close the loop back to Azale. So uh, one of the other proposals that she offers, which I like is, you know, we might do well to begin to reimagine the spaces of our coexistence with others as possessing three dimensions, experience, professional competencies and civil skills. And so I guess that's what I'm trying to embed in practice when I get to make work and also in, in learning spaces. And um, um, yeah, that's about it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alan. <laughs> it was wonderful. So the thing that I particularly thought was really interesting, or at least uh, maybe not interesting might not be the right word, but it's uh, inspiring that was the humility in the, in the way that you were saying that you don't have the answers and neither do the students, but you're using practice as a platform to be able to to um, to investigate or to probe deeper into what those thoughts and feelings were. It's really interesting, super, super interesting, intriguing. Okay, so I am going to welcome our very last two speakers uh, to the floor for our morning session. Welcome to the floor. Um, thanks, 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 V. You're a rock star. Oh, and they're even getting their own chairs. That should be me on that. Okay, so we have the dynamic duo from Exitoire. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Exitoire, my French accent's not so uh, as special as Paul Antoine's, but <laughs> that I'm uh, hoping to do my best. Okay, so these guys are from Exitoire. So um, I'll start with Paul Antoine Lucas. Oh, actually, I can do, I can do, but I'll introduce both of them together because they share so many commonalities. So it's nice to be able to say, okay, so they're both architects. They're both curators, they're both educators, they're both researchers. Um, now we've got Sun here, but he's also a designer as well. So he trumps Paul Antoine, which is in one of those, uh, those uh, um, characteristics. They, like I was saying, they both co-founded um, the Transition 3 uh, studio called Exitoire, which was in, la was, wasn't last year, it was two years ago. It's based in both Oslo and Hanoi. Yeah, so they started off in Oslo and um, in Hanoi. When did you guys move here to Hanoi? It was ten days ago. Ten days ago. Six months ago. And six months ago. You know, the way that Paul Antoine speaks about us, <laughs> I thought you were already here. But no, that's great. So welcome. Um, so, okay, so there's a really, really long uh, bio for both. But I'm just going to cut a little bit um, shorter because I want to hand over the mic to you for the last 15 minutes. Um, but in saying that, so Sun here, so apart from being an architect, designer, artist, educator, creator, his work spans some curatorial, editorial, and teaching activities in experimental drawing, visual, and spatial projects. His themes of research currently include queer methodologies and emancip emancipatory uh, pedagogies in, in design, liberatory uh, public space, as well as social spatiality of collective living. So lots of great words in there, hence I had to read it. <laughs> he, um, holds a Master's of Arts in Architecture from the Royal Danish Academy. Um, okay, of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. Okay, so and now we've got Paul Antoine Lucas. I go back to my previous page. Sorry. <laughs> lots, of thing, lots of good things to say. Um, okay, so through teaching, curatorial and editorial work, his research focuses on the right to housing in Europe, um, intersectional practices in architecture, social and spatial infrastructures of support in public space and emancipatory pedagogies in architecture education. So beautiful synergies between these guys. So super looking forward to seeing this presentation and I welcome you both. And I'm going to hand this over to Sun so he's got a Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction, and hello to everybody. My name is Son, and this is Paul Antoine. Together, yeah, we're Exutoire, and uh, we call ourselves a, a critical spatial practice. 
uh, and we founded it in Oslo, Norway in 2019, and we just relocated to Hanoi this year. And um, our talk today, uh, Space Beyond Craft, is about an early stage research through design project that explores the link between craft and spatial design as a way to anchor our own praxis in Vietnam. So shortly about the talk, we'll just start with the origin of that research that we kind of self-initiated and where it comes from. Uh, and then we'll walk you through uh, this prospective journey that we're very much just starting at the moment uh, that we've done through a bit of field work and critical observation and how we've translated that into architectural design and prototyping of furniture. And then what's next, what we actually hope to achieve by this journey. Um, and we also apologize for the whiteness of the slides. <laughs> Just of the slides. Um, so it, it would be impossible to, to talk about this project uh, without mentioning the books that inspired us at the very beginning of it. So there was Sylvie Fanchette and Nicolas Stedman's uh, discovery of the craft village uh, Jizz in Vietnam that we stumbled upon uh, in, I think back in 2021, that gave us a very insightful analysis of the network of craft villages in and around, around Hanoi and especially the social aspect of them. Um, and then there was also Alex Coles and Catherine Rossi's postcraft that questions the meanings of craftspersonship and the handmade in a changing economic, cultural, and creative landscape. And finally, we decided to put a picture up of Just Boys because I think uh, she has been very inspirational as a researcher and an architect uh, that works from a very much feminist and inclusive perspective in uh, talking about uh, inclusivity in design as a social, spatial, and material justice uh, practice that we really embrace now in our projects. And here in that talk, we really want to focus on an aspect of material justice through design. So, sort of homage to her. Um, so in summer 2022, we started our own exploration um, with field trips, so visiting craft villages, meeting crafts people, trying to understand the social geography of this craft network in and around Hanoi, uh, their struggles to sustain their knowledge and business, but also ways in which they adapt to Vietnam's changing social economic conditions. Um, so on the screen here, we can see photos of our various tri trips, like a selection of them. So here we were at, in the east of Hanoi in uh, a smoked bamboo workshop in the village of Xuân Lai in Bắc Ninh. And then we went down south to visit a lacquerware workshop in Hat Thai and also pearl inlay um, on precious wood workshops in Thôn Ngọ. Um, and then last but not least, a picture from the famous Bachang village with uh, brick workshops. Um, so here we kind of like decided to focus on the villages that are the, and the crafts that are still present in some capacity and that also represent for us possible uses for design and architecture. So in terms of uh, from those trips like framing the investigation that we want to lead as a practice. We got really inspired by this project by uh, Martin Bass and this uh, plastic chair in wood uh, designed in 2008 that at that time was questioning uh, the question, the idea of what is made in China um, through a residency in Shanghai and what does it mean uh, made, made in China to the cultural imaginary in the global world, but also what could it mean as, a, for example, related to craft. So kind of paradox of mass production versus uh, fine craftspersonship, that similar craftsmen can produce a monoblock plastic chair for mass consumption, but also very fine craftsmanship can reproduce the same chair, which is meant for industrial methods uh, by hand with precious wood, for example. So we wanted to kind of analyze or reflect on this uh, value of the work of artisanship that often gets invisibilized by global capital forces and in the context of Vietnam also what that would mean for yeah. us. And so to go back to the situation in Vietnam, so on one hand we're fascinated by the diversity and richness of forms of artisanship uh, present in and around Hanoi especially. Um, so we know that craft practices have largely contributed to the making of Hanoi both as a physical environment and a cultural entity. Uh, and today we think that those craft practices can still play a critical role in the, the evolution of the local culture 
and it is worth looking at how these centuries old traditions are disappearing. Um, and so with concern uh, with regard to architecture and design, they can prov provide, for example, great local material resources. Um, and for example, like if, if we can produce things uh, close on construction sites or close to construction sites with high quality, for example, uh, like brick, metal, or woodwork, it could reduce massively the environment, environmental impact in terms of transport and create more meaningful social economic conditions for local communities, such as like what you talked about Tao in your in your presentation. And so this is why we want to learn more about craft and learn with like and learn from craftspeople while designing. But on the other hand, we also understand the circumstances that those craft practices have to endure today. So there's the economic de development that makes them less um, demanded and pro profitable compared to other businesses. Uh, there's the fact that craft education hasn't been institutionalized and discontinued. Um, and there's also a lack of infrastructure to create work environments that are healthy, sustainable, and desirable, especially for younger people. Um, so this is where we kind of like decided to look less at the preservation of crafts as uh, like from a technical and economic point of view, uh, but we're more interested in studying the social rituals and spatialities that are linked to them to find out what those craft practices and the ecosystems around them reveal about the larger society. So how we went forward from that field trip is like kind of thinking about how we could as designers uh, think about that kind of investigation through design. And we're very inspired by the practice of Studio Mumbai based in India that really works uh, close to uh, construction sites and contexts, uh, relocating their own office as they go along making new projects. So bringing like craftsmen looking at local crafts, local material, and on-site research in order to develop new projects and kind of shape design intentions for the studio. So kind of that search for craft as a leading uh, design uh, conceptual framework. So simultaneously to our research trip, we were actually working on the redesign of a tube house in Hanoi for a client. And so this interest in crafting local material resources and know-how were very much uh, an anticipation for us of our geographical move that we have now uh, done from Norway to Vietnam and trying to figure out what craft will mean in that logic and with our knowledge base and practice that has been shamed, shaped so far from Western educational models for both of us and practice experiences, um, how can we identify uh, a local anchorage for our practice moving here? And we really found that uh, answer for us through material exploration rather than looking at maybe uh, disciplinary concern and biases that, could, that we could have in those questions. So instead of looking at uh, historical typology, uh, more formal introspections, uh, we decided to investigate our paradigm shift of moving to Vietnam from this material perspective with a concern for local resourced materials techn and techniques and how that could inform design decisions. So yeah, while looking for our nuanced perspective on the subject, we came up with this research question that reads, Using design as a medium, how can we formulate and cultivate a contemporary approach to craft beyond the preservation of the crafted as a tangible heritage? Um, so it's, it's here that it is interesting for us to look at post-craft, so going beyond sort of like those aspects of authenticities and anti-consumerism that are usually associated with craft, which is not always true uh, anymore today. Um, and sort of like trying to not romanticize craftsmanship as only something beautiful of the past, but to see it as a social practice to incorporate in design processes. So here as an image in the background, we kind of wanted to show the first experiment that we tried to do while visiting those villages and talking to a lacquer maker and how through just conversation we understood that it's not about like learning what they do and how they do it, but it's just about making with them and seeing what that can bring. So realizing that we were not going anywhere through just discussing with that person, but like 
giving a first design and seeing what is possible was the best way to learn together and understand how it works. And then by the end of the conversation, there was already the carpenter, that's the next door neighbor, coming to cut the wood to do this uh, lacquer seat that we decided to implement on an existing design that we had. So it kind of became that dialogue through design that we thought as a method to go forward with this. And then in terms of architectural design, and back to that house that we were designing at the time of those, uh, those research trips, um, we, we very much only found the grounding of the design after visiting uh, those villages uh, and really decided that craft should be uh, what would define the design. So while we were trying to understand at the time uh, how to reimagine the archetypal turn of the century tube house for a client, we we only could have designed the concept after meeting the manufacturer of bricks from Bachang. Um, so that really made us link back to material justice and design, and we found the manufacturing of local brick as a beautiful way to steer away from using generic standardized and quite unsustainable construction materials uh, as a means to generate more meaningful designs. And moreover, at that time, this material gesture perfectly fitted the brief of our client, uh, looking not to have a polished, austere, uh, modern look, but a more traditional, in some aspect, atmosphere, rustic and warm. And then lastly, what really convinced us to focus on that, uh, on the also conceptual level, was uh, this saying from North Vietnam that we found while researching, praising the quality of the bricks produced in Bachang that goes, I will say it in English because yeah, Vietnamese is not there. Uh, I wish I could marry you. I will buy Bachang bricks to build a ha house, building vertically, then horizontally, building a summer circle pond where you can wash your feet. And as we were renovating this house for a young, single female entrepreneur looking to build a place of their own to settle in, we found that that kind of uh, saying was really intuitive of like, when you start your own life in your own terms, building your house and using Bachang brick was a good metaphor for a design process. So during our conversations with the uh, craftspeople, in this case, brick makers, uh, we learned a lot about their manufacturing process, which is done all by hand, using local clay, natural dyeing, and manual coloring and glazing. So we kind of went there influenced by our experience working in Europe, so thinking that they would have a strict catalog with uh, standard products at fixed prices, and whatever sort of like that goes beyond that would, would cost a lot. But it was quite the opposite. So because of the rather small scale production and the by hand character of the products, almost anything was possible. So then that means that the design was truly created in dialogue with the producers, making the boundary between the designer and the maker uh, kind of like equivocal, but in a creative way. So then we decided to use brick as the main material for the project and its earthy quality as a guiding design principle. So on the right hand side, we can see a, a model photo of the facade of the building uh, where brick is used structurally for, yeah, for the elevation um, in a perforated pattern to leave space for ventilation and visual porosity. And then inside, on the plan drawings, um, the bricks are deployed for their ornamental value to clap the floors. And then we kind of like use different patterns of floor claddings, adding different textures to the many divisions of space and functions within the house, uh, trying to induce this northern Vietnamese atmosphere for the project. So sort of like bringing the feeling of a brick clad courtyard of a traditional Red River Delta house to the interiors of this modern tube house. So finally, to, to conclude, uh, we're thinking about that the way forward of the project and really recentering around the question of how can we learn from the inherent social, spatial, and environmental dynamics of craft practices to recenter our own practice of making in the context of Vietnam. So looking at how we can go beyond like starting design and dialogue, but learn more about uh, those craft practices within the villages. Uh, and we wanted to use this image as an illustration because it's kind of, um, so DNA design and architecture is one of many offices in China that has been part of being 
commissioned by the government for this past 10, 15 years as a government initiative to counteract rural exodus. They decided to pull money together to invest in different villages, uh, to develop new economies and provide li livelihood opportunities in various parts of the country. And that really was uh, uh, circulated through design a lot. So commissioning art architects to build new small museums, community centers, uh, different factories for different crafts or food related products that could create those new economies in those villages. Um, and so craft was often part of it. And Su Tian Chan from DNA Design and Architecture uh, really added a new intangible heritage aspect to the preservation of that tangible heritage through building those buildings, focusing on how do you cater for all the social practices linked to the craft and those villages in those buildings. So here this, for example, Tofu Factory includes an educational center for uh, local kids, but also a community center for the larger community when it's actually supposed to be a tofu factory for tourists to come and look at the making of tofu in that village. And also through beautiful design. And then through all those projects, she actually then got commissioned by the community to build extra projects for their own outside of the government. So like, for example, a tea house, uh, rest space for tea workers in a plantation, a bamboo theater, like lots of small pocket pro projects that emerge from the community seeing the value of design in creating their, um, their community. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much for uh, sharing these interesting projects. Um, can I invite uh, all the speakers of the morning here to, for a Q&I panel session? And I think we're gonna have a few chairs and then we're open for questions from the audience. bày tỏ lòng biết ơn đến tất cả các diễn giả đã tổ chức ra một chương trình rất là ý nghĩa và cũng là biết ơn tất cả mọi người đã tham gia trong buổi ngày hôm nay thì tôi có hai câu hỏi ạ câu hỏi đầu tiên là trước mắt thì tôi thì cũng xin giới thiệu tôi là Hường tôi là nghiên cứu viên của trung tâm nghiên cứu Việt Nam học thì có hai câu hỏi đầu tiên là có câu hỏi với chị Thảo Vũ ạ thì hiện tại là tôi cùng các nhà khoa học cũng có đưa ra một cái đề xuất đề xuất có nghĩa là thiết kế 63 bộ áo dài tương ứng với 63 tỉnh thành mà trên mỗi bộ áo dài đó sẽ có cái nét đặc trưng của mỗi tỉnh có nghĩa là như thế nào tôi ở Vĩnh Phúc thì tôi sẽ có một cái bộ áo dài của tỉnh tôi để làm sao khi mà mặc cái bộ trang phục đó lên thì người ta sẽ nhớ luôn là đây là cái người tỉnh nào của Việt Nam Đấy thì hôm nay rất là biết ơn có tất cả các nhà thiết kế và đầu ngành ở trong và ngoài nước. Thì tôi cũng có nói với các thầy là hôm nay em sẽ đề xuất đấy, với chỗ chị Thảo cùng các nhà khoa học. Coi như là chúng tôi là nghiên cứu ra cái đó, còn lại không thiết kế được. Đấy, cho nên là nhờ các, các chuyên gia, tôi rất là khát khao và cũng viện rất là khát khao để một ngày nào đó là có 63 cô gái đứng trên coi như là thảm đỏ 
và trình diễn 63 bộ áo dài tương ứng với 63 tỉnh của Việt Nam mình. Nghĩa là Hà Giang là có cột cờ lũng cú, rồi thì là uh, Thái Nguyên là có hồ núi cốc và đồi chè. Đấy, có nghĩa là sẽ đó cũng là cái cách để quảng bá cái hình ảnh của Việt Nam mình. Tôi cũng nói các thầy là em làm sao là các nhà thiết kế để người ta nhìn đến bộ đấy là người ta muốn đi du lịch Việt Nam. Đấy thì đó là cái mà đầu tiên tôi đặt uh, câu hỏi với chỗ chị Thảo Vũ là rất là mong, rất là mong mỏi. Và đây là cái công việc chung của cả Tổ quốc mình. À, thiết kế được như thế là để đôi đấy. Di sản tương lai mà. Bởi vì không bao giờ hết được Việt Nam ạ. Không bao giờ hết được các tỉnh. Cho nên cái bộ đó là mình thiết kế ra mãi mãi về sau. Đấy là câu hỏi mà cũng là đề xuất của viện đối với các nhà khoa học nghiên cứu ở đây. Còn cái câu hỏi, cái vấn đề của tôi mà tôi cũng vừa đặt câu hỏi nhưng cũng là vừa chia sẻ đó là cái dự án của chỗ anh Sơn mẹ Núc Cát ấy. Bởi vì tôi là lớn lên và sinh ra tại làng nghề, làng nghề truyền thống của Việt Nam ạ. 400 năm là làng nghề truyền thống Việt. Thế là làng nghề của tôi là thủ công là uh, thiết kế và thi công các công trình đình, chùa, miếu mạo của dân tộc mình đấy. Nhưng có một thực tế là tôi thấy bây giờ mai một rất là nhiều. Và cái chính nhất là chính cái nhận thức của người dân ấy. Bây giờ làng tôi là các bô não, nghĩa là thiết kế đình chùa là phải từ năm 60 tuổi nên người ta mới làm được gọi là phó cả. Thế giới trẻ rất là khó. Nhưng mà khi mà nói chuyện với các bác là các bác có đào tạo giới trẻ không? Thì gần như là không có cái nhận thức đó. Nghĩa là họ không nghĩ rằng mình phải dạy lại cho thế hệ sau. Như làng tôi thì cũng không có là cái không gian chung để là như thế nào đó cho nên mai một rất là nhiều. Hiện tại bây giờ cả làng là để đi vay tiền ăn tôi rất là xót xa. Mà thực tế là 400 năm là đã gây dựng cũng có làng thờ tổ rất là nổi tiếng nên là nghề Bích Chu ấy, nổi tiếng ở Vinh Phúc mà cũng là Việt Nam. Nhưng bây giờ cũng nói chuyện với nhau mà bây giờ anh em không có việc. Nên là người ta đi không không có cái cái thừa ấy mà không có nhận thức ra là mình phải đào tạo để mình đi nối nghiệp cha ông. Đấy cho nên là tôi Uh, một cái liềm đau, lỗi đau của tôi với cái việc là yêu văn hóa Việt Nam mà lại đưa đứa con của làng nghề. Khi mà thấy uh, bà con mình bây giờ đi vay tiền ăn như thế tôi rất xót xa. Mà trong khi đó thì uh, cái cái kiến trúc Việt Nam mình bởi vì cái rốn tâm linh toàn nhân loại mà. cho nên cả thế giới đổ về thì là người ta nghiên cứu. Thì mà rất là đáng quý mà xây dựng 400 năm rồi. Cho nên tôi rất là mong muốn là một ngày nào đó tôi có thể mời đoàn đoàn nghiên cứu về đến làng tôi cái sự xót xa của tôi cũng như là mình bởi vì bây giờ là rất là mai một rồi đấy là không có dạy lại mà bây giờ các cụ là lớn tuổi rồi không đào tạo lại là rất là khó đấy thì tôi rất là khát khao với một cái cái tâm một người con Việt Nam cũng như là một người con làng nghề lớn lên là, là hít bội và cũng chết đi cũng hít bội bởi vì làng mộc mặc dù tôi nghiên cứu văn hóa cùng các nhà khoa học tôi cũng là người nghiên cứu viên nhưng mà cái bội mộc đối với tôi là trong trái tim của tôi Đấy, cho nên là tôi cũng rất là xót xa như thế. Đấy, thì tôi cũng có hai câu hỏi như vậy. À, cũng rất là mong các chuyên gia, các nhà khoa học, à, chúng ta đây là những người rất là yêu đất nước và yêu con người, yêu nhân loại. Thì cùng với nhau để làm sao mang lại cái bình an và cái di sản tương lai chính là cái tình yêu thương và lòng biết ơn. Tôi xin cảm ơn rất nhiều. Tôi xin hết ạ. Cảm ơn chị. À, cho chị xin phép trả lời trước. Um, <cười> um, đây, đây đây cũng là một một thử thách về thiết kế đối với tôi tôi nghĩ là là bên viện của chị chị bên làm vi ạ à? ở bên viện vi ạ à? à việt nam học ok à, tôi nghĩ đây có lẽ là một cái ý tưởng cho một cuộc thi à, quốc gia cũng cũng là thú vị thay vì là dành cho một cái thương hiệu độc lập như là km một không chín nhưng mà tôi cũng đưa ra một số các cái um, tùy hướng À, theo tôi thì là áo dài khi mà mình đã chọn áo dài để làm đại diện cho Việt Nam là là cũng hơi can thiệp đến cái tính đa dạng văn hóa của Việt Nam rồi. <cười> à, tôi rất à, tôn trọng cái ý tưởng của chị cũng như là đấy cũng là một cách hay bởi vì à, thực ra trong các cái sự kiện thì áo dài luôn luôn được lựa chọn à, để 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 làm một cái quốc phục. À, tuy nhiên tôi thì lại hơi phản đối về cái việc này. <cười> vì là 54 nhóm dân tộc anh em rồi tỉnh thành như chị nói à, tuy nhiên thì mỗi cái tỉnh thành này à, lại là nơi trốn của rất nhiều các tộc người khác nhau 
À, và tôi nghĩ rằng là nên mình nên chọn chính những cái 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 phục trang mà đại diện uh, ngay chính cho các cái cộng đồng bản địa đấy thì lại thú vị hơn bởi vì áo dài um, thực ra là áo dài tồn tại trong văn hóa của người giao cũng có giao áo dài uh, trong văn hóa của người nùng cũng có cũng người tài cũng rất nhiều người mường cũng có thế thì cái việc mà dùng cái từ áo dài này cứ gắn bó với dân tộc kinh của mình ấy là hơi bị san phẳng cái cái landscape về văn hóa của việt nam đấy ạ à, thì tôi nghĩ là phải chăng thì chúng mình nên tìm một cách để thiết kế đưa ra những cái bộ trang phục đại diện cho chính những cái tỉnh thành đấy hoặc là chính các cái, cái 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 sự đa dạng văn hóa ở trong cái cộng đồng đó à, bởi vì nếu mà mình cứ mỗi dùng mỗi áo dài để kể chuyện văn hóa của mình thì lại nó nó rất là đơn độc và nó bị một màu, nó bị thiếu và thế là theo tôi đấy là cái cách trình bày không đầy đủ về văn hóa của người Việt. À, xin lỗi đây là đây là quan điểm riêng của tôi à, và có thể phải chăng là mình thiết kế áo dài và tích hợp những cái uh, biểu tượng văn hóa của chính những cái cộng đồng ở trong các cái tỉnh thành đó. À, có lẽ hơi khó một cái áo dài mà phải gánh vác rất là nhiều <cười> văn hóa của các cộng đồng khác nhau <cười> thì hơi khó à, nhưng mà tôi vẫn khuyến khích cái việc là lấy các cái biểu tượng địa phương à, để là để 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 thiết đưa ra một cái bộ trang phục đại diện cho địa phương ấy thay vì là thiết kế áo dài à, đấy là ý kiến của tôi ạ à, cảm ơn câu hỏi của chị xin nhường micro cho bạn nhé cảm ơn rất là cảm ơn câu hỏi của chị ạ. và em cũng xin lỗi trước là nhiều năm nay cũng chưa ở, không 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 ở Việt Nam thế nên là chắc là tiếng Việt cũng không được nói nó không được rõ lắm thế nhưng mà um, chúng tôi rất là rất là hiểu cái 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 nỗi niềm của chị về cái uh, gọi là tương lai của làng nghề thế thì đây là một cái chủ đề nghiên cứu mà chúng tôi nghĩ là trong những năm tới sẽ rất là mong muốn là sẽ được uh, tiếp tục phát triển Đấy, thế nhưng mà khi như tôi có nói trong cái um, trong cái bài diễn thuyết nó là Uh, cái việc phát triển làng nghề là một cái câu chuyện vĩ mô hơn rất là nhiều đấy như chị nói là uh, cái việc giáo dục nghề là tôi nghĩ là cái 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 là cái mấu chốt trong cái việc phát triển này và cái có một cái đặc điểm về nghề thủ công đấy là uh, nghề thì chỉ truyền từ mẹ sang con từ cha sang con từ ông bà xuống cháu chứ mình không có sách vở thế nên là nếu mà mình muốn phát triển giáo dục nghề thì là mình phải 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 đưa cho những cái người làm nghề một đúng là một cái khả năng để phát triển được một cái cuộc sống rất là toàn diện. Thế nhưng mà bây giờ uh, gọi là cái hình thức phát triển kinh tế của nước mình thì thực ra là cũng rất là tư bản. Đấy, nghĩa là mỗi người là tự làm, tự làm là theo tức là theo kinh tế thị trường rồi là ai làm được thì được. Đấy, uh, thì những cái nghề là 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 nó cái, cái khả năng phát triển là kém hơn so với so so với những cái tức là nghề thủ công, cái khả năng phát triển kém hơn so với cả những cái nghề khác rất là nhiều vì cái hình thức phát triển đó. Thế nên là để 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 mà duy trì được những cái nghề thủ công này thì tôi nghĩ là cần phải có những cái chính sách vĩ mô từ nhà nước xuống uh, hơn rất là nhiều. Đấy, là, chẳng hạn như là phát triển về giáo dục này rồi là tạo điều kiện tức là có những cái bắt dịch có những cái ngân sách thật là chu cấp và cho cho cái việc phát triển nghề thủ công này. Uh, thế nên là với tức là trên công vị là các nhà thiết kế hoặc là uh, kiến trúc sư thì đây là một cái mà chúng tôi rất là mong muốn được tìm hiểu. Thế nhưng mà chưa, hiện tại đang chưa biết được là mình sẽ làm được gì trong cái trong cái câu chuyện này, thế nên là bọn tôi đang muốn là tức là sẽ được bắt đầu để được gọi là gọi là tìm hiểu thôi và có thể là trong một vài năm nữa, năm năm nữa, 10 năm nữa thì mình sẽ có thể gục tức là góp sức vào những cái những cái dự án nghiên cứu nó lớn hơn và nó có cái tầm tầm ảnh hưởng uh, quan trọng hơn. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to all of the great person presenters today. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is um, Chi, uh, also go by Ichi. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at University of California, Riverside. So I'm very much interested in um, the, um, the recent growth of creative economy uh, agenda in Vietnam um, in recent years. Um, so I have two questions for the, for the speakers today. So the first question is I was very fascinated by uh, the notion that um, uh, Paul Antoine and Son and Dr. Um, Allison Bennett mentioned, like you mentioned uh, this idea of material justice and social justice. And I think it is very important because I think all of the speakers today spoke about inclusion 
in creative economy. Uh, so could you elaborate a little bit more on this idea of material justice and, social, and um, spatial justice? Because we have all talked about social justice and we have all talked about like, environmental justice, but these ideas, I think, um, they're very interesting um, and would need like, more um, discussion to move forward. So that is my first question. Um, and the second question to all of the speakers here, so it's actually related to Sun's answer earlier. So what do you think about um, the structural changes um, in the creative economy? So for example, policies or infrastructure in Vietnam. So does there need to be structural changes? And if there, and if there are, then uh, what do you think? Like what could the government, for example, do um, to move forward? Just ask suggestions for policymakers in the future. Thank you. Try this one. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. And I think, like, especially talking about like maybe social justice, I can start first. I think it goes a bit back to the previous question. Is like, how do you not project, especially in our role as designer, how do you not project like, okay, then it should be preserved. But of course, like livelihood opportunities is what matters for a craftsperson. Is like, can you make money out of it? So like that really is like the key anchoring point in. The preservation, I think, like as Sun was saying, like global market forces are actually what drives the interest of the craftsman to develop something that's also maybe less painful uh, as a practice and that's more sustainable for transmission as well to their kids and such. So I think it's also about like developing maybe community networks, like working with lacquer worker, for example, for us then meant like talking about it with some friends that actually also went to that person to develop like pieces for furniture. And then for us to also keep on developing that relation to try to create more work for that person that we enjoy uh, working with and seeing what that can do and how that person can also develop their own livelihood opportunities, maybe creating their own design in that way or like, yeah, learning new applications of what they do instead of doing like, for example, tourist objects that was the main um, focus of their practice. Um, and then I think in terms of yeah, material justice, I think that was quite interesting for us to see how, because we're working like on a private commission of a house and we, didn't, we couldn't figure out an anchoring for our practice of like thinking more about uh, social and spatial justice in a private project for a house. So we really tried to think about what it means in design for material justice. And I think uh, Tao Vu is really into developing very strong networks that represent that idea of like it's um, circular production, but it's also how do you develop same like livelihood opportunities for communities that you work with and make sure that it's preserved in a way that they feel comfortable with. And so developing in dialogue, I think that's the main key in that way. I'm not sure this is working. Um, as I've been listening to all of these conversations, I keep coming back to a, a conversation that we had last night about the almost in, incommensurality of incompatibility of craft values and capitalism. Um, and that the, the things that, are, that make craft important in terms of that sort of circular relationship with the means of production, um, the, the knowledge of how to produce something and the intimacy one has with that material artifact and then the return of that artifact to a circular production. Um, th those values are very difficult to sustain under a capitalist driven system. Um, and so I think it, it, we're, we're kind of twisting ourselves into circles trying to make craft sustainable within market forces. And um, I, I think Maybe we need to shift our thinking, perhaps. Uh, and it's really about the frameworks we use to think about the world that dictate our choices and the impacts those choices have. So in terms of, from my point of view, about these sort of questions of justice, when we talk about climate justice or ecological justice or cultural justice, um, for me it's about uh, the kind of frameworks I use to think about the world around me. Um, 
in my community, we move a lot, we think a lot in terms of um, uh, post-humanism as a philosophical framework um, and the idea that the human is not the central but we are one of many entities in the world and we need to, to understand that we are not the top of the pyramid by any means and to think ourselves in relationship very differently. So that's my approach. Um, I don't think that we're going to change the world just by thinking happy thoughts, but I think we need to change the world in terms of what we value and how we understand ourselves in relationship. Thank you. And maybe I'll just like like add some parentheses to maybe like the discourse of like how social, spatial and material justice are linked. So I think like we came from a place of, yeah, sort of like battling for social justice, meaning that sort of, um, so based on the idea of how everybody is entitled to the same means, not only for livelihood, but also for thriving in life and fulfill, like having like, yeah, the access to a fulfilling life. And then um, during our research as spatial practitioners, we also found out that space, I think it's sometimes is a forgotten element in like, like as one of those like principles of like how like how to get access to that life so for example like in the in like the un kind of uh, decides that everybody actually is like it's a fundamental human right to get an adequate housing condition and adequate doesn't mean four square meters in a shack like somewhere like adequate means like the same it should be it should mean the same thing for everybody all in the world so like access to space is sometimes something that we we don't think about so that's why uh, we want to push the social justice uh, towards like a spatial justice. And uh, we ended up with material justice because even though we think a lot about space as something intangible, like a community is a space, um, a human kinship is, uh, could be like a space, but then in order like to foster all of that somehow at the moment we still need like physical infrastructure, and then we need materials to in order to construct that. So then, but then in thinking about materials, there's always this idea of, of extraction, like of natural resources, but also human labor. And there's a lot of discrimination and oppression in that. So how can we think about uh, the materials that we use to build the space to give uh, to yeah foster social and spatial justice in in a, in a just way? So maybe. Um, we had an interesting uh, talk with uh, La Femme, who uh, encoded uh, textiles. And they were saying, because they work with um, ethnic minority groups, and sometimes you, that capitalist approach, that they, they're farming while they're also undertaking their traditional kind of craft practices. So um, you can't expect to have everything output you know, 100 items that are exactly the same. So again, it's renegotiating our expectations, I think, if we're working with people who are holding, you know, those kind of craft traditions. Um, and then it could be perhaps, rather than looking at scaling up to meet manufacturing, perhaps it might be looking at um, uh, craft or cultural tourism as an option that's more supportive of the communities where people visit and they learn the traditions and crafts rather than um, something where they're having to constantly produce on demand. Um, and another aspect of that is um, also looking at, um, there's uh, textile linkers with another village. They're starting to do artist residencies and they shared information with us recently where designers or artists can go and work with the community for two weeks in residency. So there are some interesting different models of how we can kind of um, work with these communities in a sensitive way rather than kind of, I think, we can easily overwhelm them with our demands, yeah. Um, I've been working with um, seven uh, ethnic minority groups uh, across Vietnam, and that's not including um, the crap uh, villages outside of Hanoi and other provinces. Um, what I th what I think is from the government perspective um, to um, really create the uh, safe space uh, that people including me as a creator, um, willing to share uh, our resources. 
share the knowledge, sh share the experiences, um, share the creativity, um, and um, also share the access uh, to to uh, to others. Um, but in order to that, uh, in in order to do that, um, we need to do a lot of things before that. To be honest. Um, <clears throat> Education involved definitely. Uh, I think is many um, institutions, including IMIT uh, and other university in Vietnam, uh, we and Vietnamese um, university as well. Uh, we really need to uh, have some courses uh, about um, um, intelligent property, about um, respect. Um, you know working respectfully uh, with local community uh, and also with the other, um, you know, like researchers, educators, designers, uh, that you, you feel safe, you feel safe to share. Uh, because, uh, you know, when we, you work with ideas and being creative, um, it's it's you you know you you always feel you in the in the spot that um, you can the idea can be stolen by someone or the connection the networks everything uh, so make we ourselves feel safe uh, first it's 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 the first thing we we can do so we can be trust. Um, you know, trust here is mean like not just um, finance trust, but you know, creative trust. Uh, that you like, yes, you know, I'm willing to open the door for you to do a research. I'm willing to do a workshop with you <laughs> without worrying too much about like, oh, you know, we might lose connections. Uh, or, you know, people have a own kind of purpose when they they doing their projects. Uh, so I've been working. F with um, people from different fields, researchers, anthropologists, um, um, uh, professors, uh, and students, uh, and entrepreneurs. Um, and I also running heavy uh, intensive workshops uh, with Nungan community. And I realized that is uh, to be able to share knowledge, um, is you have uh, to overcome so many things. Um, so, building trust in the community is, is really important, especially in Vietnam. We've seen very early stage. It's very unstable. Sometimes I feel I, had, I, I got hurt a few times, <laughs> badly. Uh, and it's not only come from local, international as well. Uh, so, I think create the safe uh, space is it's so important for all of us. And that is the work of everyone, uh, government, school, uh, university, and individual as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's um, really, really beautiful, actually. Um, yeah. OK, OK, OK. Because I already like mentioned all of it in my, like, my presentation. So um, what uh, Tao would you share, like, make our group and me feel so good about ourselves. Like, we are doing something. Um, as an artist, like normally we don't think that we give solution. We don't cure cancer and shit. We just like react to things. And the reason that our space like continue exists and giving out what we have to the community is like our is like a proof of our reaction as an artist to what happened right now in in, in terms of like society system. Yeah, so um, thank you for RMIT to give us a platform to introduce what we're doing to all the indoor audience here. And thank you for <laughs> linking us all up together. Yeah. We love yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, likewise, don't want to share solutions, but just, it, I was just reflecting, I think it's a really great question and kind of building on Alison's point that's why I have found that distinction between like survival, professional, civil distinction useful. Because like, yeah, we can, if we can set up, if we stick into survival and professional only, then the problem kind of remains. Like it's not adequate. There has to be a civil dimension because it's not just monetary value that we're seeking. Like it's knowledge. 
and it's important knowledge that the world needs. So it's while ever we re while ever we remain limited in a professional or survival domain, then we have the problem remains basically. So that's what, I just think that's that's why I find that useful. So I can kind of apply that everywhere. I'm like that doesn't quite. It's not going to be enough. That's not going to. So it's not a solution, but it, it tells me when we haven't quite got to a solution or something like that. So. Of course, you can have a question. We love this. Questions are like, you keep this one and I take this one. Please. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your very, very um, like amazing presentation. So I'm actually very overwhelmed right now just having reflections about my own practice, re having reflections about being in Australia as a Vietnamese and what does it mean for me as a role as a creative practitioner. So thank you a lot. I'm actually like, I'm about to cry, but like, I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna finish asking the questions first. So I have two questions, first for Tao and second for Alison. Um, so for the first question, um, Tao, I know you're, I'm uh, sorry I missed your presentations because I was late, but um, I have been attending your presentation online through Teams meeting when I'm in Australia. So I understand and I know your passion and your practice. So for me, um, ethnic minorities cultures um, is so not represented well enough, um, especially being a Vietnamese in Australia. I always have people come to me saying like, oh, we love your banh mi, oh, we love your ao ya. And then I always have this feeling like, yes, thank you. Thank you for appreciating this. But we're, we have much more than that. Like there's so much more in um, our heritage and our cultures. And I remember even when I was an RMIT Vietnam student with my first assignment doing a poster design with Zhang, I did a ethnic minorities poster design, um, trying to foster bilingual education for the northern, western mountainous areas, the Hmong children, for them to be able to receive bilingual education, not only the Vietnamese that you guys all know, but also their language, their mother tongue language. And I think, I don't, I, I have been like lost touch with the ethnic minority study since then because of my experience moving to Australia to continue further study. And since I'm in Australia, I feel like I'm, I've been caught up in this mission of, okay, I'm trying to introduce you guys the Lunar New Year tradition, making banjung, this kind of stuff, but I'm almost like stopped, like I lost touch with the original kind of mission when I was in Vietnam, like trying to represent and protect the ethnic minorities, um, cultures and, and things. So, the practice that you're doing is so valuable and it's so important, especially for even just us. Like we make up, we're made up of 85% of Vietnamese, but we're not 100% of them. There's still 15% of um, yeah, Vietnamese that are at, at, at risk of, of having their cultures and tradition fading away. So I'm asking, um, it's just also because I haven't been doing proper research about ethnic minorities cultures in Vietnam. So I, I wonder how, how at risk, how the, the, lo the risk of, of loss of ethnic minorities cultures and how fragile are they um, at this state? And is there anything I can do as an augmented reality 3D creative practitioner even when I'm in Australia, like I, I'm just, I really want to contribute in, into this initiative. So that's my question for Tao. And for Alison, um, your practice and being able to be in this journey with you on this trip actually has opened my mind in many ways because um, I have always been kind of like 3D model all of the intangible heritage assets of Vietnam in like, a, like through my own I imagination, because I was in Australia, I couldn't be able to like be here and then take pictures and do photogrammetry and reality capture. So it's so important that um, I'm, I'm be able to like learn from you through this trip. But um, I'm also aware that this current state in Vietnam, where a lot of our historic sites were destroyed and um, not maintained really well, um, especially during. Um, yet yeah, being bombed um, and also the lack of care of maintenance and 
turned into touristic sites and stuff. So um, lately, I've been visiting a few, like Hue Citadel and a few sites in the north. And it has been you know, so heavily bombed that there's nothing left. And there has been some kind of initiative projects of vi virtual reality explore, where I've seen the 3D reconstruction of the whole space. And where you are about, you're able to like fly around the citadel and like look. And then I like spotted out like, oh, the trees from Unity Assets. Like it's, 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 it's shouldn't supposed to be there. Like who knows what trees do they have back then? But it's kind of like glamorized and beautified all of these historic sites just for the purpose of, you know, like uh, for the audience to be able to like imagine and visit. So I, I wonder, do you have any like guidance in terms, not, yeah, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but it's like we're in this kind of like unique um, spot where there's nothing left to, you know, being photographed. Um, so do you have any kind of just suggestions or for, for you know, practitioners in Vietnam when they're doing this kind of 3D reconstructing? Because I know it, it's quite, yeah, it's like slightly not too related, but um, because you have the expertise and you have the, um, in this field, I wonder what you think. I'm sorry for the very long question. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. Um, I think you're already uh, in the picture. You're already doing it. Uh, the project about the Hmong language that you're doing in Australia, I think it's, it's that's, we get involved. Um, and uh, again, I'm working in the textile and fashion, but um, music, language, um, architects like you know, guy doing. It's so many more uh, fields that we can, um, you know, participate and, and, and to be a part of, uh, of the whole picture. Um, the, the trip like this, revisiting hometown, homeland, uh, maybe find a, a community, uh, a specific community, like the Hmong community in Vietnam, they, they, they're spreading uh, in many different parts of Vietnam. Uh, Flora Hmong, Blue Hmong, Black Hmong, Water Hmong, Green Hmong. Uh, it's so many. Uh, the sub uh, group is, is more than hundreds. Uh, and each sub group, they also own a very vivid and colorful, diverse um, controls, um, you know, in, in different fields, uh, basket weaving, um, matchmaking, and it's, it's so many. Uh, and I'm, you know, I can't um, remember quickly to, to name it out. Uh, but yes, uh, I think investing in specific um, community that uh, it keep it simple, um, you know, work with the idea you already, you already have. Uh, maybe like introduce to, to find a way online, virtually or uh, physically to connect with the people in, in, in you know, you, the audience uh, in Australia with the local Hmong, uh, so they can be connected like that, you know, directly. Uh, that also is great to, to set up that kind of bridge, uh, so you can learn something is very authentically. Um, and uh, again, you know, get the classmate, uh, schoolmate uh, involved with with like uh, social projects like that. Uh, sorry, I call if it's correct. <laughs> uh, but that's how I start. That how I start. I start with one Nungan group in Kaobang. I spent four years and a half before I launched the first collection uh, that I work with them. So it takes time. <laughs> it really takes time. And spend time with the community before you start the project. It helped you a lot um, to understand uh, the community as a whole and to each individual that you're going to work with. Uh, and also to have you to um, recognize other things around them, uh, which I did. Uh, because I, I, I start very quickly the beginning, like, oh, I have this great idea. I want to work with you and make it didn't work that way uh, I, I failed badly so um, so yes yeah, spend time with it watching them you know like um, spend time with them and maybe have some 
type of uh, idea that you want to generate uh, with them uh, that also have uh, a lot for you to, to start with. But yeah, so many ideas. <laughs> Sorry. Not at all. Um, I think as one of the great things about doing a PhD is getting to ask these kind of questions, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and to maybe extend on the f what you were asking, Tao, um, I've wanna, when we first started our project, we started with a series of online briefings um, and we realised that um, we needed to explain our practice of acknowledgement of country um, in Australia, we always begin by acknowledging the indigenous owners of the land on which we work. Um, and Australia, in Australia, we've moved from um, a sort of a, a radical silence about the people who have cared for our country for millennia to beginning to take a journey of making space for those experiences and knowledges. And uh, my colleague Tao um, very generously led the first session and attempted to unpack for our Vietnamese students and colleagues the, the notion of that practice. Um, because we're also very curious about um, who belongs to this land, yeah? And what is your relationship to this place? And how has it shaped you? And, and uh, in Australia, we kind of invert the idea of land ownership. You don't own the land, the land owns you. Yeah. So who is owned by this place and how has that shaped you? I, I, and I don't, I've got no idea. I'm really curious to find out. So um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether the, the idea of ethnic minorities is the right, is the right language to use? No. Yeah? Well, it's... I have to be very careful to um, to say certain kind of statements. Mm. It's okay for you, but um, I prefer to call them by their name of the group. Um, or if I can, uh, I prefer to call them by their language as well. Uh, and I think it's, it's good for us, you know, just to come to, to visit the new home, that you um, ask a few questions that uh, how, how you want us to call you and what is the most comfortable way of, yeah, call, call themselves, yes. Thank you. Um, so part of doing a PhD means you have a, a, a reason to reach out to people to speak to them, not just the, the communities that you want to grow and support and um, generate, but people like Amar Gala, the professor in uh, India that we met, um, and my colleagues such as uh, Pia Johnson, who specialises in migration and mobility as well. Um, coming back to your question to me about um, the what, what can we do with the digital space, I think, as you've mentioned, like in a way you're already doing it, you've acknowledged that um, the trees are all sort of assets from a multinational that's got nothing to do with the local environment and you notice that and you ask that question. That's the, the first radical step towards making something more authentic. I was just going to very quickly add, there's a kind of connection to me in like the way Australian landscapes was painted as if it was English initially, for instance, and things like that. So it is a kind of risk of a kind of colonialism in those spaces, I'm thinking. So it's, yeah, great question to be working out. Yeah. No, okay. I just want to react to your your, your question and concern. Um, we we don't work with ethnic minority or like national heritage. We don't work with that, but we we do have a space, and the space have so many change because like it's a flexibility of space, and it's a downgraded house. So. Um, for example, like we have a gate 
and one day when we wake up, the gate is disappear. So the house don't have a gate right now. What's the key for? Um, and the way we, the way that we like fix that and react to that so quick, because I think our community, for example, we have gave them the, as I as I said before, is like the the sense of belonging, and the 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 they are aware of their ownership to the house and to the space, as well as like um, with, as well as like I I think it can link to your 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 concern about like um, connection to the ethnic to the like your community or for example here is ethnic minority I think is a is a best way I I, I think I just can guess like, this can be work in our way that like make them aware of um, of their ownership to their own heritage and to make them engage with it by cohabitat with them yeah and let them co-programming once they once they know their ownership, they can cohabitat and co-programming with you. Yeah, that's just my suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, trước hết thì uh, em xin tôi xin uh, cảm ơn cái sự xuất hiện của các diễn giả uh, trong buổi ngày hôm nay. Em xin phép là em trình bày bằng tiếng Việt, tại vì <cười> Thì uh, em là một sinh viên đến từ trường Đại học Khoa học Xã hội và Nhân văn và em đến từ khoa ngành văn hóa học, một cái ngành khá là mới của trường và xuất phát từ khoa lịch sử. Thì um, em thấy những cái vấn đề hôm nay nó rất là hay. Tuy nhiên thì uh, trước uh, em xin có một cái câu hỏi chung cho tất cả các diễn giả là với uh, các diễn giả thì cái di sản tương lai trong suy nghĩ của các diễn giả là gì trong cái um, suy nghĩ đó thì nó có phải là một cái thứ mà được tạo ra trong cái đời sống hiện tại hay không hay là nó đã được tạo ra từ quá khứ và nó được chúng ta lưu giữ bảo tồn và phát triển đến ngày nay và trong tương lai nữa và liệu là nó có mối liên hệ nào tới um, giữa các cái di sản tương lai này với uh, các cái uh, di sản đến từ khứ hay là các cái công nói như là các cái công trình kiến trúc cổ hay là các cái um, di tích lịch sử mà nó đã vốn có ở Việt Nam hay không uh, và đó là câu hỏi của em tuy nhiên thì em cũng uh, có khi mà nãy em uh, em được ngồi đây nghe, nghe cái um, sự tham luận của mọi người thì em cũng có một mong muốn là được một chút chia sẻ thì bởi vì là em đến từ cái ngành văn hóa và cũng rất là may mắn khi mà em được có những cái việc làm mà liên quan trực tiếp đến với các cái công việc cộng đồng hay là về cái việc mà ví dụ như là có một cái dự án về làng nghề hay là kể cả thiết kế gốc ấy ạ thì em có được biết đến một số cái chính sách của nhà nước cũng như là các cái Uh, quy trình để mà nhận nhận diện cũng như là uh, bảo vệ rồi là có những cái uh, biện pháp đối với những cái uh, là nghề thủ công truyền thống hay là uh, những cái mà thiết kế gốc thì em thấy là ý kiến của mọi người là những cái uh, ý kiến rất là mới mẻ và sáng tạo và cũng như là có uh, cái sự đổi mới hơn so với uh, các cái uh, chính sách vốn đã có Tuy nhiên là có một cái hiện thực mà em nghĩ là có thể là chúng ta ai cũng có thể nhận thấy đó là uh, muốn di sản có thể uh, được nhận thức thì về cơ bản là chính cái cộng đồng mà họ sở hữu di sản đó họ nhận thức đúng về cái di sản của mình. Tại vì uh, mọi người cũng thấy là di sản nó đang mai một đi rất là nhiều, nó đang dần dần biến mất. Và nếu như mà chính cộng đồng đó họ không có cái mong muốn hay là họ không có nhận thức đúng để giữ lại cái di sản đó thì nhiều cái sự tác động từ bên ngoài vào thì họ cũng sẽ rất là khó để mà chấp nhận. Tại vì về cơ bản là di sản được sinh ra trong cộng đồng, một cộng đồng nhất định và họ có những cái họ chính là người nắm giữ di sản ấy, thì họ sẽ là người hiểu nhất làm sao để mà duy trì được 
cái di sản này và ở cái hiện tại thì chúng ta chỉ có thể đưa ra cho họ những cái giải pháp mà uh, để chúng để để có thể nâng để giữ gìn được cái di sản đấy tốt một cách tốt hơn cũng như là hỗ trợ họ thôi và về về cả về những cái vấn đề như là dân tộc thiểu số thì chúng ta cũng đều nhận thấy là không phải mỗi Việt Nam mình là có đa đa dân tộc đa nhiều dân tộc như thế mà rất nhiều các quốc gia khác trên thế giới họ cũng có những cái dân tộc thiểu số như vậy và cái việc mà nhận diện từng nhóm cộng đồng cũng đã là một cái vấn đề rất là khó khăn à, vì là có nhiều những cái cộng đồng mà họ à, họ mong những cái cộng đồng mà họ đã được gộp vào một cái nhóm cộng đồng nhất định thì họ lại mong muốn được tách ra để được hưởng thụ những cái chính sách của nhà nước hay là chính sách của uh, uh, chính phủ. Thế nhưng mà có những cái nhóm cộng đồng thì họ lại mong muốn là được gộp vào hay như thế nào đấy thì đấy lại là đến từ cộng đồng và em nghĩ là cái gốc nhất của di sản thì nó vẫn phải đến từ cộng đồng. Và bên cạnh đó nữa là có một số những cái chia sẻ từ chính các thầy cô của em khi mà đi nhận diện những cái uh, văn hóa của cộng đồng ấy ạ. Thì chúng ta đều biết là không phải là vùng nào và uh, khu vực nào cũng có thể uh, có điều kiện để tiếp cận đối với cái xã hội hiện tại hoặc là theo đến cái trình độ như hiện tại và họ có những cái nhận thức cũng như là có những cái nó giống như ăn sâu với tiềm thức của họ rồi thì mình 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 rất là khó để thay đổi và uh, có những cái cộng đồng người bởi vì họ không được uh, cái cốt yếu là họ không được theo đối với cái trình độ xã hội hiện tại hay là chúng ta gọi cơ bản như là về nhân dân trí hay là uh, về nhận thức ấy, thì họ sẽ có những cái cư xử rất là thuần túy của họ hoặc là họ có những cái cơ chế bảo vệ uh, họ phòng thủ đối với uh, chính tộc người của họ và hay là họ uh, không sẵn sàng hay là họ có những cái nói chung là nó cũng có những cái nguy hiểm đối với những cái người mà họ tham gia để uh, nhận diện cái cộng đồng đó thì chúng ta cũng phải uh, nhìn nhận về cái đối tượng là chúng ta phải nhận diện cái cộng đồng đó như thế nào về cả hai phía thì em nghĩ là cái này nó cũng là một cái uh, khá là nên được uh, mọi người chú ý đến tại vì uh, đôi khi là những cái người mà đến với những cái nghiên cứu như thế họ cũng cần được sự bảo vệ để tránh khỏi những cái điều nguy hiểm từ chính những cái cộng đồng, cộng đồng đó ấy. Em xin hết ạ. Uh, cho mình uh, trả lời uh, câu hỏi của bạn. Uh, <cười> Sorry, I, I think I keep spinning. <cười> um, uh, I think it's um, keep um, the, the the heritage alive. is 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 a very complex work. Uh, it's not one or you know, not black and white at all. It has some gray area. And the gray area, I think, is even bigger <laughs> than the black and white uh, area. Um, like you say, um, uh, I, you recognize that as well. It's, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about the future heritage. So what is, what is here? You're thinking about future, so this thing is it's, it's not happening yet. Um, but I think it's, Uh, future heritage, yet, as I understood, um, is is the combine of the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and if we and we constantly create new heritage, um, and the the new heritage, it it really reflect um, our ancestor, our grandparents, ourselves, and our kids. Uh, so that's what I understood about um, future heritage. Um, and like you said, it's working with uh, different um, communities, local community, it's really hard. Uh, I'm not come from the community. So when I came in as an outsider and, and with ideas, you know, and all of that, um, <clears throat> I realized that it's, it's, I'm still a guest. Uh, even now, I'm, I'm still looking at myself and, and as, a, as an outsider, I'm not a part of community. So yes, um, working with the community, we should 
um, give the, you know, completely the, the power for the community, respect them, uh, and also let them breathe. Um, if they want to work with you, great. Uh, if they don't, that's stop right there. Uh, <clears throat> but I, uh, I think as um, you know, in Vietnam, it's it's certain community is more sensitive than the others. Uh, we need to learn to study before we we shake their hands. Uh, we we need to be aware about that. Uh, identify um, the, the the strength and the weakness. Uh, I recently uh, visit you know, four uh, communities, two uh, Bana community in Zalai, and two Cham in Ninh Thuận for my projects. Um, and this project is about Phát triển đồng đều. What is that word? In English? Sorry, I can't think right now. Phát triển đồng đều. What is that? Like like. It's inclusive, thank you, development. Um, <clears throat> uh, this project is about that. Uh, let them, them raise their voice, let them decide, let them get involved, let them, um, you know, like uh, set up being created by themselves. Uh, what we can do is just nurture them, support them as much as, as we can behind their back. Um, we don't need to be, you know, on the stage or <laughs> um, just, that's them do the, uh, doing that, and uh, this project is about that. But it's again, it's not easy at all. When I show up in uh, in Bana, uh, first day is great; it's no problem at all. But the second day, we start seeing other uh, problem from the local authorities and from from the indigenous community as well. Uh, that we come from Hanoi and they check up our backgrounds. <laughs> I travel with my partner; he's American. Uh, and at the first day, they own when come, and the second day, um, we got the notification from the police that uh, there's a one foreigner taking photos in the community. Uh, so we again we kept step back. We don't, you know, we um, we talk to the local staff. That is that is that a good way to approach uh, this community or not? Uh, and they said no. I think it's it's fine. Uh, you know the. The local um, people, they they worm and they went come. But the next day, we uh, travel to the same village with uh, local uh, staff. Uh, <laughs> um, and yes, it changed the environment a bit. Um, but it, it be sensitive to um, you know to when you decide to work with community or to be present in the community. We 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 yeah. You know, something that uh, behind uh, my head every time I, I travel and visit, even the community I work for, for, for over 10 years, I still very careful, um, you know, be cautious uh, about things around you. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. And I would say, because again, I'm a foreigner and coming into communities, and my experience is. Um, just sometimes it's more reflecting on yourself. So like when we use the word modernism, like what does that mean? Um, and to maybe look at, well, if you're elevating it above the traditional practices in the community, um, people will sense that. Um, and then they'll, they, they kind of, they'll, they'll kind of block or close off. So again, it's very much about creating like the inviting spaces where people feel safe and welcome. And I, like, I've had lovely workshops where none of us have shared a common language at all, but just by sitting around and just making and it, yeah, it opens up. I think that and more being side by side rather than, you know, if you look at how you're sitting in a group with them, like maybe it's a circle is going to be much better than people up here, people over here. So, yeah, lots of things you can do to kind of make that, building that relationship easier, yeah. Anyone have last, last comment? Okay. I have a question, I guess. Um, as you were speaking, I noticed that people's faces became quite emotional and so I got a sense that there was something, that there was a lot of energy or emotion in the question that you were asking. Can people help me understand what that was 
about. It's, I mean, there's, there's, you've talked about the ambivalence around heritage and sometimes we can call like tradition as being bullied by dead people kind of idea. We don't have to repeat the past. There's lots of things about the past that we're actually very happy to move away from. Um, but there's also things that we need to value about uh, what makes us ourselves. Uh, can anyone, I, I wanna, I'm going to ask a question maybe, New York, I saw you be quite emotional. What was that about? Tôi phải chia sẻ thế này này, làm việc với các cộng đồng, mình kể cả là những cái dự án được hỗ trợ hoàn toàn và sau đó thì cộng đồng, dự án kết thúc thì cộng đồng làm sao để có thể tiếp tục và hoàn toàn tự chủ trong cái việc sản xuất cũng như là sáng tác. Cái việc mà các bạn phải làm ngay ấy mà có thể thay đổi được làm cho các cộng đồng uh, bản địa thì có thể uh, cởi mở hơn và tin vào cái giá trị của của các cái sản phẩm thủ công của họ hoặc là các cái giá trị văn hóa của họ. Đó là các bạn cũng phải revalue nó. Uh, bởi vì tôi thấy là um, có rất nhiều uh, cộng đồng họ họ rất là practical nhé, họ không họ không 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 nghĩ uh, cao siêu gì đâu. Uh, nếu mà họ sống được bằng nghề thì đấy là một cái động cơ ngay lập tức nó đã tác động đến cộng đồng rồi. 
và để sống được bằng nghề thì các cái sản phẩm của họ phải được 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 cái giá trị của của nó phải được nhìn nhận một cách đúng đắn nó không chỉ là những cái sản phẩm lưu niệm rẻ tiền hay là những cái sản phẩm mà chỉ để phục vụ cho các cái cái cái, cái occasion thôi các cái dịp quan trọng nào đó nó nên được sử dụng hàng ngày và để làm được việc điều đó thì cộng đồng cũng cũng phải hợp tác với những người như các bạn những người làm sáng tạo rồi là những nhà quản lý rồi làm chính sách nữa để làm cho cái sản phẩm nó relevant to our our today uh, so you know it's just, that I think is um, is very important sorry I'm mixing Vietnamese and English um, yeah we need to to value Uh, the products, uh, the cultural products uh, from these communities. And I think that is, it's helped the community immediately um, because we keep saying nice thing, beautiful thing, with us. we really want to help them to, uh, to preserve their traditions, but we not really um, create um, the livelihood to bring the, uh, the economic um, value to the community. It's, 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 it, it's not, you know, It's not sustainable. So yeah, that's my <laughs> opinion. Uh, xin chào mọi người, mình uh, không có câu hỏi gì nhưng mình muốn phản hồi lại bạn một chút là với uh, vì các bạn với vai trò là nhà nghiên cứu ấy thì mình cảm thấy là nếu mà đặt vấn đề như thế thì hơi có vấn đề một tí. Uh, thứ nhất là nếu mà uh, bạn uh, bạn nói rằng là khi mà cộng đồng là không muốn giữ nó thì thì phải làm thế nào các thứ thế thì cũng uh, em hoàn toàn đồng ý với chị Thảo là đầu tiên là nó về vấn đề sinh kế và thứ hai nữa là mình cần phải tôn trọng cái sự uh, cái sự quyết định của cộng đồng bởi vì không ai hiểu họ bằng họ và tại sao mình lại là người ngoài mình lại đánh giá rằng là là, là tại sao cộng đồng họ không giữ nhìn cái này đẹp thế, cái này hay thế Cộng đồng họ có cái tri thức của họ, họ có cái khả năng nhận định của họ Và và chúng ta chúng ta gọi là nếu mà là một cái vai trò là người ngoài Thì cái mà chúng ta nên làm đó chính là thúc đẩy cái trao đổi Để chúng ta hiểu tại sao Trước tiên, chứ không phải là chúng ta đánh giá rằng là Tại sao cộng đồng không làm việc đấy Không thể đổ lỗi cho cộng đồng cái việc đấy được Đấy là cái điều thứ nhất mà mình nghĩ rằng là khi mà là những cái nhà nghiên cứu thì thì hơi nguy hiểm nếu mà có cái suy nghĩ đấy. Cái thứ hai nữa là uh, cái à, sự nguy hiểm của nhà nghiên cứu khi đến cộng đồng ấy thì mình nghĩ là uh, làm việc gì cũng có cái rủi ro nghề nghiệp của nó. Nhà nghiên cứu cũng có rủi ro nghề nghiệp và nghề nào cũng thế cũng có cái rủi ro nghề nghiệp. Thì Đấy là một cái có thể là cái rủi ro nghề nghiệp và nó cũng phản hồi lại, nó tương tác lại với cái chuyện là các bạn đã tiếp cận nghề nghiệp như thế nào. À, và tại sao lại đưa ra cái chuyện là khi mà những cái người ở những cái cộng đồng, ví dụ như là vùng sâu, vùng xa chẳng hạn là họ lại không được phát triển bằng nên là thế này thế kia thì tôi nghĩ đấy là một bệnh đề sai. Vì tại sao chúng ta lại đặt mình khi là những người ở thành thị lại có cái chuyện là hơn người khác. Nếu mà chúng ta không có một cái lăng kính ở một sự tôn trọng cái sự đa dạng và muốn học hỏi từ chính cộng đồng thì tốt nhất chúng ta không nên đi đến cộng đồng làm việc cộng đồng. Bởi vì trước khi mà chúng ta nghĩ đến chuyện là chúng ta bị tổn thương thì chúng ta đã làm tổn thương người khác rồi. Thì 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 tôi nghĩ là như vậy thì uh, thì tôi hy vọng rằng là là tôi xin lỗi cái phản hồi của tôi chắc cũng hơi hay cay gắt một chút. Vì bản thân tôi thì cũng là Uh, một người mà cũng làm việc với các cộng đồng khác nhau và và cũng là là có cái nguồn gốc là cũng ở một cái cộng đồng nào đó thì tôi cũng luôn luôn nghĩ rằng những cái sự dễ bị tổn thương hoặc là những cái gọi sự nhạy cảm nhất định ở trong cái quá trình làm việc ấy, nó là một cái điều mà bất cứ một nhà nghiên cứu hoặc là những cái người cán cán bộ nào làm việc cộng đồng rồi nghệ sĩ nhà thiết kế đi làm việc cộng đồng đầu tiên là là phải tự tự rèn rũa bản thân mình việc đấy trước đã nếu không thì tất cả những cái chuyên môn của mình sẽ không thực sự được áp dụng mà cuối cùng nó trở thành cái con dao hai lưỡi. Vâng, tôi cảm ơn. Maybe I'll just I'll just add to that a little little bit. 
So I think to, to go back maybe like to the to your your like the first question of the uh, of the young person is like for me like future heritage is actually very based on the present and that's why like in like while we were discussing like what we wanted to present today we really wanted to stress on the fact that we don't want to romanticize what exists in the past because I think that's a lot of like that's that's the focus of, of a lot of those conversations. It's like this existed. It was so beautiful. Like why are we losing it? And no, but like today, like this is today's reality. Those marginalized communities are struggling for a reasons, and like most of those reasons are structural. And the because of the privilege that we have that to like even be here today to discuss about this, I think like we are all sort of like we're part of that system. And then like it's not. I, I don't see our, like, our point of view is not to find a solution for that, but it's more like to, to really understand and to cope with it. So what like you mentioned, Tao, I think it's really beautiful and like, we totally agree, like doing also like community engagement, like, time is the most, like time is one of the most important parameters and also like our like, just open-mindedness and the fact that we are there to understand to collaborate and to maybe like find something that we can do together, but not to impose on 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 others like what we think is 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 best. Tôi xin nói hai phút ạ. Bởi vì là chỗ chị Thảo có nói về sinh kế, thì hôm qua tôi cũng làm việc với cộng đồng gốm của của Linh Thuận đấy. Đấy, gốm nha. Thì tôi có kết nối với các uh, cộng đồng doanh nhân. Bởi vì doanh nhân là xúc tiến thương mại. Thế từ cái việc là người ta chưa hiểu được cái sâu sắc cái lý thuyết. Nhưng mà quan trọng là cái sản phẩm này tôi bán được cho ông. Và tôi xuất khẩu được là xong. Đó là cái việc mà tôi cũng có hẹn các anh. Nhưng mà hôm nay là sang đây đó, chiều gặp. Đấy thì đó là cái chuyện là uh, ba tôi cũng là một uh, ban tổ chức của Uyết Cô Việt Nam. Thì nó là liên kết các dòng họ với cái doanh nghiệp, các doanh nhân, các dòng họ ấy. Thì tôi rất là mong, mong là các nhà nghiên cứu có cái sự kết nối các doanh nghiệp. Bởi vì mình nghiên cứu, cái người nghiên cứu thì lại không giỏi kinh doanh. Đấy, thường là thế. Đấy, còn đâu thì uh, cũng nói về chỗ bạn này có một số lối sợ ấy ạ. Thì tôi cũng nói thật là tôi là tập hợp đối ngũ trí thức yêu nước toàn quốc. Thậm chí công an bảo theo dõi tôi chứ. À, người ta hỏi tôi làm này sợ không? Tôi bảo không. Tôi làm chính trực. Và tôi là người đưa rất nhiều đoàn đến nhà Tổng Bí Thư Trường Trinh. Mà nơi đó là các cam của chính trị Việt Nam. Nhưng mình đi bằng cái tâm mà. Lớp thân, lớp trí và lớp tâm. Khi mình đi cái tâm á, mình không sợ gì. Công an mật theo dõi tôi nhé. Nhưng cuối cùng họ thấy là chẳng ai đứng sau à. Chả ai thao, thao túng à. Đây là cái người yêu nước thực sự. Thì theo dõi người ta chỉ có ủng hộ thôi. Đấy cho nên là khi mà tôi đề xuất cái cuộc thi Hoa hậu Ái Quốc với Bộ Văn hóa Thể thao Du lịch thì coi như là đều là nhất là rất là rất là tán thành chứ không gì là sợ cả. Thầy tôi xin thành cảm ơn. Thực ra thì như thế này, không phải là em đổ lỗi cho cộng đồng và cũng không phải là em nói là uh, cộng đồng phân biệt vùng miền hay như nào cả và cũng không phải là em bảo là cộng đồng đáng sợ chỉ là như thế này. Uh, những cái vùng mà cao hơn ấy ạ Thực ra thì mọi người cũng Em không nói là kiểu họ nhận thức kém hơn hay như thế nào Nhưng mà ý là Cái điều kiện để họ có thể tiếp xúc Và họ có thể tiếp cận đối với giáo dục Ở một cái Tốt nhất ấy ạ Thì họ không có Họ rất là khó Như kiểu bây giờ các em trên vùng núi Các em đi học vẫn còn rất là khó khăn cơ ạ Thì nó là một cái khó khăn của cộng đồng Ý em là như thế Cái nữa là cái đáng sợ của cộng đồng ở đây là gì ạ? Nó ý em không phải là kiểu cộng đồng sợ không chia sẻ hay như thế nào mà thực ra thì uh, thật sự là em không uh, đây chỉ là những cái chia sẻ trải nghiệm bởi vì thực ra là bọn em cũng có những cái trải nghiệm rồi và bọn em chỉ là uh, thấy là um, có lẽ là trong cái xã hội nào hay trong bất cứ một cái vùng nào thì đều có người tốt người xấu hay như nào đấy chúng ta đều biết là có những cái cực đoan và chân nhà không nên nhắc tới thế nhưng mà ý em là ở những cái cực đoan hơn chứ nó không phải là kiểu cộng đồng không muốn chia sẻ hay như nào đó tại vì thật sự là um, nó là của cộng đồng thì cộng đồng muốn chia sẻ hay không thì đó cũng là quyền của họ và bọn em chỉ chỉ là 
mong muốn đến tìm hiểu hay là mong muốn đến để chia sẻ thôi à, có những cái đề phòng ý em nói ở đây đó là gì là với những cái người mà họ đi, đi đến với mục đích xấu ấy như, như cô cũng chỉ có chia sẻ đó là um, khi mà đi đến bằng cái tâm thì mình không có gì để phải sợ tất nhiên là cái sợ ở đây không phải là sợ cảnh sát sợ chính phủ hay như nào đấy mà ý em nói ở đây là sợ những cái việc mà họ um, có thể là họ sẽ um, khi mà mình đi trực tiếp phỏng vấn thì uh, tất nhiên là có những cái người mà họ cảm thấy uh, không đáng tin bởi vì là họ đã từng bị lừa chẳng hạn thì họ chỉ là cái cơ chế phòng thủ cơ bản của họ như thế thôi chứ không không phải là có một cái gì đấy quá cực đoan như là mọi người vừa chia sẻ đâu ạ nó chỉ là những cái rất là đơn giản như thế thôi ạ Obviously, this shows there's a lot of uh, need to to have these discussions about future heritage. It's, it's a very um, like ongoing topic, so so there's much more need for uh, for, for this. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for sharing uh, this morning. I think it was uh, fantastic. And we are back here in half an hour, actually. Yeah, at <laughs> at one thirty. So thank you so much for this morning and for everyone who. Uh, Drop me a while when I kiss you at night